I'm Renette Sunham, and this is the Lifestylist Podcast. Well, we are in for a treat today, folks. Our guest, Renette Senum, is a natural-born leader and a real firecracker. She's traveled to nearly 60 countries and has an incredible ability to connect to those around her, no matter where she is or who she's speaking with. In 1994, she crossed Alaska alone, which we will discuss at length in this episode. Ultimately, lessons learned along the trail would become the catalyst for her community work later in life. She's protested against corruption and greed for decades. She has twice served as a city council member and mayor of her hometown of Nevada City, California, where she served with integrity, regardless of how difficult the political landscape was and is. And it was during the summer of 2020 that she chose to step down from her third term on the city council because she saw a deep need for leadership at a much larger scale than she could provide in her little town. And as a former longtime resident of California, I think we can all agree that uh, they are pleading for a trustworthy, common sense leader. She's currently running for California governor with no party affiliation and the first child centric campaign in history. And after you hear this conversation with Renette, it's likely that you're going to want to support her campaign. And you can do so at electrenette.com. That's R-E-I-N-E-T-T, electrenette.com. And you can also find the show notes for this episode at lukestory.com slash wake the bear. And I want to let you know, if you like this episode, you're going to love my Telegram channel, where I post all of the content forbidden by the control freaks censoring the other social media platforms. You can join my channel at lukestory.com slash telegram. That's lukestory.com slash telegram. Here's just a taste of the path to freedom we discuss in this conversation. Renette's focus on helping to restore California and how the strategy she's implementing could be applied in all states how mandates and government overreach gave Renette no perceivable choice but to run for governor. She also tells the story of becoming the first woman ever to cross Alaska completely alone in the dead of winter. That story is incredible. That could have been the podcast itself. But what she did with that experience is perhaps even more interesting and definitely empowering. We also talk about the juxtaposition of being relatively progressive, but still labeled as a right-wing extremist by mainstream media, which is just hilarious. Uh, How Renette is giving a voice to victims of adverse events. You know what I'm talking about, those events, and the experts that are trying to prevent them. We discuss insights Renette gained while co-founding a homeless advocacy organization and launching the country's first extreme weather shelter for the homeless how she launched a community-wide campaign that successfully prevented the installation of eight Verizon microwave towers, so you know she's a hero of mine just for that alone, how and why life-saving early treatment interventions have been extensively expressed and made completely unavailable even to those who actively seek them. We also destroy the Democrat-Republican scam, the illusion of choice as seen through Renette's insider perspective in politics, and gaining political power without joining the club. She goes in depth to cover her seven-step contract with Californians that sounds a little like utopia, but not the propagandized version of it. And finally, shifting the cannabis conversation from legalization to being conscious of cannabis farmers and bureaucratic overreach. A lot of this conversation is geared around helping to empower us little old civilians to create change from the bottom up. So get ready to get fired up and wake up your inner bear with the one and only Renette Senum. I got to tell you, you're in for a real treat. And if you find this episode as empowering as I did, please, by all means, share it with your friends and family, especially those located in California. Okay, here goes episode 401 of the Life Stylist Podcast. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. I first saw you speak at uh, a private event here in Austin. Uh Yeah. That's um, right. I I think it was was kind of a secret, you know, sort of private private community event of sorts. Uh, So I won't go into detail as to not incriminate anyone present, (laughs) but um, there were a number of speakers that um, got up and just kind of said some things about themselves. And when you got up there and started talking about, A, California, which I love and and miss in so many ways. 
I was like, man, she's just fiery. I like her. <laughs> and I remember I saw you and I think I even yeah. said to my wife, mm-hmm. Allison, I was like, I'd like to interview her. I don't know exactly what right, she's up to, but right. she's got it, yeah. you know, so I'm glad we ended up connecting. And I've been inv- invited to that only a couple few days before. It just it was happenstance. And I was all of a sudden I'm just there and, you know, next to the group. And, and I was just like, how did this? And I had five minutes, like I have five minutes to. They were short. Yeah. And it was five minutes. Yeah. And it was like, OK, so I just came. I went in full throttle. So yeah. They've never nobody knows me here. They've never heard of me. I'm just going to go full bore. So well, you and, made, and everyone up into a standing ovation. I'm like, that's the fastest standing ovation I've ever gotten. <laughs> you made an impact. Yeah. Yeah. That was an incredible night. It um, was. It was a beautiful I was, night. I was getting goosebumps the whole mm-hmm. time. I was too. You know, the, even just, audience, the people. Yeah. It was extraordinary. Yeah. 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 That's, I, that was, I, I don't think we'd lived here that long at that point, a few couple of months. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. I kept saying to Allison, I was like, man, do you feel this? Do you, mm-hmm. Are you getting chills? Like, mm-hmm. you know, hair mm-hmm. standing yeah, up in my arms. Right yeah. Now, I was just, just like, that. man, I think I know why we're here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know how it's going to pan out, but mm-hmm. so many people um, yeah. of a like mind seem to have converged. And that was the first night I even went public with me running. Really? Yeah. That was about a year ago. I had been very, quiet you know and so wow and even then i thought i was running for the recall which i did not do in oh that's right so, yeah we were talking about mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. yeah that was a good call <laughs> i know see <laughs> politically savvy <laughs> yeah that was that was a good call you yeah. would have shot your shot your shot uh, yeah shot your wad on that one i'm glad you said those words um for people listening you can find the show notes uh, for mm-hmm. today's show at lukestory.com slash wake the bear that's wake that's the bear which is a part of your campaign yeah. which we want to talk about of mm-hmm. course um And I would like to say, too, that while your energies, uh, for the listeners, while your energies are focused on California, for those that live in different states like myself or different places in the world, I think the model that you're presenting Mm -hmm. there and the work Mm -hmm. that you're doing in California Mm -hmm. is a template that could be followed elsewhere. So as we get into the conversation that's a little more politically centered, which Mm -hmm. is historically kind of outside of the norms of what I talk about, it's not my lane of expertise, Sure. um, so I don't. I just kind of avoid it, but I think what you're doing is very unique. And right now we need change. So that's mm-hmm. why I wanted to talk to you and mm-hmm. just want people to tune in. If we get very California centric, yeah, that this is, it applies everywhere. These are just mm-hmm. solutions based in truth and, mm-hmm. and liberty of mm-hmm. the human spirit, which I think are mm-hmm. applicable widespread. But before we do that, um, I got to know how in 1994, you became the first woman to cross <laughs> Alaska alone in the dead of winter <laughs> while filming for National Geographic. Mm -hmm. Um, I've heard you tell an abbreviated version of that story. And I was like, I got it. Just selfishly, (laughs) I got to hear that story. It's just so wild. I like to say to people, uh, well, I went out to get the mail one day and got lost. No, (laughs) Um, you know, it it was a multitude of reasons. Um, uh, What had happened was I had been traveling around the world after my adoptive mother died at 18. And uh, before then, when I was 11, um, I was adopted at two months old. And I have to tell this part. So when I was 11, my adoptive mother had a great aunt come from England with a family tree that went back 900 years. And I was enamored with this. I love history, right? And I was just like, wow, wow. And then it dawned on me, it wasn't my family or my blood. So I turned to my mother. I said, well, when do I get to see this with my family? She's like, oh, no, you'll never know. And as happenstance, which I have a lot of this happened in my life, the next day there's a local paper that talks about finding out your natural family. You can go to these research organizations. So as an 11-year-old, I wrote off to all of them saying, would you help me find my mother? Wow. And within a week's time, they all wrote back saying, legally, there's nothing we can do for you until you're 18. And from the information was general information that I gave them that I had not identifying information. They said, you know, um, you have plenty of time in, you know, your mom's young, you're young, you have time. Well, they didn't know it and I didn't know it. But my natural mother was actually fighting breast cancer at that time and would die a year later at the age of 35 in 1979. And so then my adoptive mother also died. When um, she, I was 19 and, um, and she had already told me by that time, my name was Marcella Anderson and she had lied. So for tw- almost 20 years, I went looking for the Andersons and it was the wrong name. She, oh my yeah, God. She died before she could go, sorry, honey, I was just kidding. And, um, and so then now I'm in my mid twenties uh, and I couldn't find my family. I thought they've just disappeared. I can't find them. And I tell people the funny story of, I always had this fantasy of driving up and down I-5 in California, there's iconic uh, pea soup Andersons. And I used to think maybe that was my family. So I had this fantasy. I know that place. Right? Yeah. Everyone, yeah. Yeah, going in there and seeing people look just like me, you know, serving soup. I'm like, mom, dad, that was my childhood fantasy. 
Um, so now I'm in my 20s and I thought I'm never going to find them. And um, and at that time, I'd been part of a South Pole expedition I trained with, but I couldn't go to the South Pole, couldn't raise the money in time. Then I organized my own Transantarctic expedition with just women only. And after having them on the team for 10 months, I said, hey, Renette, we've been doing this stuff for 15, 20 years. You're just starting. And they went to the South Pole without me. And after a year, I mean, I was really depressed, even I'd say even suicidal because I was just I didn't have the tools to deal with. Wow, people can take your dreams like that. And then I came out of it. And like a year later, I thought, well, you know what? When you started this, you didn't even know how to ski. You didn't know how to climb mountains. You weren't even EMT. You didn't know the difference between a Z pulley and a Z pulley. And you didn't know crevasse rescue skills. And now you've learned all this. Just go find something to cross. Because I want to see what I was made of. I'm like, you're never going to find your family. So just go out there break a new trail and see what you're made of. So I spun a globe, looked at Greenland, looked at what else, um, Siberia. And I thought, no, I'll cross Alaska. By that time I'd climbed an alley already. And I'm like, that will have plenty of challenge what I'm looking for. So then ultimately I ended up going up to Kodiak Island up in Alaska. I thought, well, I'll do is I'll, I'll commercial fish. And if I commercial fish and I'm not tough enough to do that, then I'm not tough enough to cross Alaska. It was a great litmus test. And I could save up some money. I'm working so hard, I'll just save money, not spend it and pay for the trip myself. So I got a boat after walking the docks in Kodiak Island called the Big Valley. And I would actually watch that boat 12 years later sink on a show called The Deadliest Cat Catch with my captain and, and uh, four of his, of his uh, crew members. And after commercial fishing for six months, and, and when these guys found I was going to commercial fish or actually go out there and, and ski across Alaska, they're trying to you know, break my will. And when I got off that boat, I was done with humanity. I'm like, I'm out of here. I'm going to go way out into the woods and never see any of you again. And, huh. um, and then I went to Homer, Alaska, started putting my gear together, um, made my sled, got my polar suit together. And then I called up National Geographic to see how do you weatherize a camera for extreme cold? And they asked, well, what are you doing? I'm like, well, crossing Alaska by myself. Like, we'll send you the equipment. And so they did. And, um, and so, uh, and, and I was, you know, I was proud of myself that I got that far and then I survived commercial fishing. So like, okay, I'm ready for this. And then I started training with two dogs. I had them harnessed to my waist. I was going to ski journ. And I got the two dogs from a local um, neighbor named Jack Barry, who was an Iditarod dog sled racer. And, and I started training with them for, you know, gosh, a few months. And we were skiing, I don't know, 15, 24 miles a day. And I was fit as a fiddle and ready to go. And then Jack Barry, who owned those two dogs, came up to me five days before I was to leave. And he said, I don't think you can do it. In fact, I think you're going to die before you make the first hundred miles. So I'm taking the dogs back. And he's walking away. He's thinking for sure, I'm not going to go now. Who's going to help me pull my sled? So I yelled at him and just screamed, fine, I'll pull the sled myself. And five days later at 55 below, I'm out there and going down the frozen Yukon River up on the sled oh without my dogs. You had me at 55 below. I know, I know, right? Today, I think it's like 40 here with a wind chill. And I'm like, yeah. Well, I'm, okay. Everything's <sighs> relative. I'm chill, I'm cold too. So the irony is I'm cold. You know? But um, yeah, so there's a lot of that, right? There's a lot of poss There's a lot of opportunity to give up, right? That's for sure. So so here I am on the frozen banks of the Yukon River and um and I'm, it's afternoon by the time I have the mail plane land and, and drop me off. And uh, I'm along the, uh, the um, Canadian-Alaskan border. And, um, and I'm looking down the frozen Yukon River and I see the biggest thing that scared me, which is a big gaping hole in the, in the uh, ice. And, um, and then as soon as I see that, I'm like, no, not that, you know, cause I always had this fear of breaking through the ice and then, you know, going under the water and drowning. That was like my one fear. And, and then I started to kind of choke up and I thought, just lay your topographical maps out and just get a handle to yourself. And I lay them out. And then I look way down the river and I see a bend in the river and then I look on the map and it barely registers. And I realize how huge this state is. And I'm like, oh my God, what have you done? And I have 14 bucks in my pocket. I'm like, there's no way out except for down the river. You don't even have enough money to fly out of this situation. And by that time too, I have to tell you, Luke, I had had so many people trying to sabotage and stop me or protect me or prevent me that it was so hard just to get on the banks of the river that I'm like, I'm here now. You can't stop now. You've been through hellfire just to have this opportunity. So you've got to, you've got to see this through. And so... I'm sitting there and I'm starting to cry because I realize how big this state is. And then my eyelids start to freeze together. And I'm like, I can't even afford to cry. So I start coaching myself, which I've learned to do over and over again. I'm like, okay, okay, this is point A. Point B is way, 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 way down there. Just to get going right now, what do you need to do? And I thought to myself, I need to make dinner. Okay, then make the camp, put that together, go to sleep, get up in the morning, make breakfast, break camp, ski, do that again the next day, the next day, the next day. And then 
I was actually able to see myself on the other side of Alaska looking back. And I'm like, okay, I can do this one step at a time. And I started. So I ski uh, for just three days, um, almost froze to death my third night out. My body was convulsing and shaking and it was a real close call. And my eyelids had snapped, frozen off because I had a big polar suit on and I was perspiring so much. The, the moisture was rising up, catching on my eyelashes and weighing them down. So when I tried to slide the, the, the ice off, it just snapped all my eyelashes off immediately. Oh my God. And then uh, three days in after my night, third night out surviving, uh, I came across, uh, I was told about these two trappers. They're having a big uh, dog sled race called the Yukon Quest. And there's these two trappers. It was one of the racers saying, you know, got 16 miles and, you know, it's going to be getting colder tonight. It was already 55 below. I suggest you get there. And, and I could barely make 10 miles because the snow is really dry and sticky at that temperature. So things were just dragging. Just dr I had no idea how. So you're on cross country skis? Cross country skis. Got some metal you, poles. Do you have a radio sled. or anything? No radio, no tent, no gun. <laughs> no gun? No gun. Oh my God. Well, you know what? Did you I have bear spray? No, I didn't. I didn't. But, you know, I did have a Winchester rifle, which, by the way, I would, didn't even know how to shoot. The, I mean, I, I've been, you know, I didn't know how to load a gun. I knew how to shoot yeah. a gun, but not load a gun, clean a gun. And what happened was the same guy, Jack um, Barry, who had the, the two dogs he took away, he started trying to like st stump me, like stop me from going. So he finally at one point said, you know what? In order for you to take these two dogs, you need to have 200 booties, fleece booties to protect them. And so I had to like sell my gun in order to get the fleece booties from, for, you know, my dogs. And even then he still took the dogs away. So he was trying to stop me, you know, prevent me from going because part ego, part fear, you know, for my life, I'm sure. Um, so I'm like, take the, take the, take the rifle. It weighs a lot. And I really don't know how to load and fire that thing. And if a bear is charging me, I'm certainly not going to have the capacity and those temperatures. The thing will probably just freeze up anyway. Because as soon as you get into those temperatures, you're on Mars. Everything works differently. Everything. Nothing works as it did before under normal temperatures is what I discovered really fast. The tent didn't come together. In fact, my first night of the tent, after trying to put it together, I almost froze my fingers. I handed it to a, um, a, a park ranger who was passing by me just as I was leaving. I'm like, take my tent. It's too heavy. I want to lighten my load. I almost, almost lost my fingers. And I was told you can lose your, you can lose your feet to frostbite, but you can't lose your fingers. And I almost lost my fingers like immediately out the gate. So I'm just take it. And then three days into the trip, I come across these two trappers who I was told to get to and I ha I could only make 10 miles and I actually stuffed my polar suit with Reese's peanut butter cups. I'm like, okay, baby, you're going to have to get 16 miles and just like, you know, so I'm like, okay, you get to that fallen tree way down there. You get there, you get a Reese's peanut butter cup and I'm like ski like, you know, like a bat out of hell and I get to that tree and I pop a Reese's peanut butter cup in my mouth and I'm like, okay, you see that bend in the river? You get there, you get another one. And I just kept pushing and pushing myself because I knew if I did not get to that trapper's cabin, I was going to die that night. I was not going to make a fourth night out. I was just perspiration. I was so wet. I was so freezing cold. And I got to the trappers. And then they're like, you know what? Just stay for a little bit because the next morning, like, just stay for a little while. It's still really cold. And I'm like, okay, sure. And I did, you know, for 10 days. <laughs> and they gave me a trapper's boot cap. They taught me how to break through four feet of ice to set a beaver trap, how to make an Athabascan fire, how to make a spruce bow mattress, how to make a, a trapper's camp. I mean, it was a boot camp. That's so cool. Yeah. Did you end up trapping any beavers on the No, thank goodness. There? No, in fact, you know what? It's very funny, but they... I have, I have a friend that eats, hunts and eats them. He says they're delicious. I'm sure they are because they're probably really fatty. Yeah. I bet they're delicious. But yeah. in fact, they actually wanted me to come back the next winter and I was so honored that they're like, thought I could actually do this. Like, you want your own trapper's line? You, you know, 300 feet, you have your dog team and you just go around and you circle around 300 you know, miles say 300 feet, 300 mile trap line. And what you do is just keep circling around that trapper's, you know, line, 300 miles, just go around and around for day after day and you catch all the animals along the way. And I'm like, well, I'll do, but do I have, do I have to catch anything? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds exciting, but I don't want to catch anything. Um, and it ends up, interestingly enough, that not having a tent was the smartest thing I'd done because you don't want a tent. There's a way of building a fire and, and kind of reflecting the heat onto your sleeping bag while you're on a spruce bell mattress that is really a better way to keep yourself warm. So that's what I started to do. Wow. And I know. And then 200 miles in, I got to my first village of Circle. And by this time, I realized that I could handle the, I could handle the, the cold. But and I told psychologically this was going to happen. The colder it got, the more intense it got emotionally and psychologically. It just does a number on you. I mean, there's a big difference between 25 degrees and 55 degrees. You can't feel the difference, but things go wrong faster. You freeze faster. And things just intensify. Your emotions, your thoughts intensify. What are you eating out there? 
Well, um, I'm eating a lot of what's called pilot bread, these big, huge, thick crackers, lots of peanut butter. Um, and then I have a lot of pasta. I was eating two cubes of butter raw every single day, like a candy bar, and it tasted delicious at the time. And um, I, w- I would argue that it still tastes delicious. I know, it still tastes I love it. I, still, <laughs> I, 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 I don't eat butter sticks, but I'm known to take a little spoonful of ghee, you know, oh, yeah. just uh, by itself. I, it's tasty. I probably still eat two butters, two cubes of butter a day, actually. But, um, you know, lots of fatty things and carbs and stuff. And I used to put like, tang in my water and I was battling because I'd put tangy water in my insulated container, you know, to drink my thermos. But the hardest thing was keeping myself hydrated because you have to drink the water relatively fast because it'll start to freeze. Right? Oh my God. And then That's towards the crazy. End, yeah, and then towards the end of the day, you can't stop to melt more snow. First of all, there's barely any moisture in the snow. So even if you melted down a whole pot of snow, you only get like a quarter of an inch of moisture. Wow. So is that what you were doing for water? Is oh, just yeah. melting snow? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then the, the hard part was I had to have 6,000 calories a day. Um, and, and I still had like, you know, I don't know how many, just dozens and dozens of Reese's peanut butter cups. And I still lost 25 pounds on this trip. But the, the thing that was really hard is eating 6,000 calories a day is not an easy feat. And what was really awful is that by the end of the day, I was exhausted. All I wanted to do was sleep. And my food tasted like pine needles and, and ash because it's, I'm cooking this stuff on an open fire. So, and of course, you know, in the snow is all these pine needles and branches. Mm-hmm. And so it tastes like crud. And so eating 6,000 calories under normal circumstance is difficult, but under that circumstance, it was really hard. And so, yeah. And, you know, you just have to be highly, highly focused, right? You can't really mess up. And so um, now I'm 200 miles in and I realized the cold's really, you know, tough, but the loneliness was tougher. I mean, another trapper, uh, his name is Douglas Fur. He's uh, yeah. an outlaw <laughs> from the lower 48. And um, and he he and I told him I said I I need a dog. I need something else to focus on, and I need the attention, you know, on something else other than how intense this is, and the loneliness. And so he's like, I got three dogs. He actually had like 30 dogs, but because I have three dogs, I'll be shooting and killing this spring because they're not fast enough sled pullers. So um, you can take one, you can take all of them, and two of them are too wild. They almost bit my hand off. And then there's one named Diamond was my birthstone and was really sweet. I'm like, ah, meant to be. So I attached him to my waist. He could barely pay me, you know, pull me uh, a mile because he was on a, a, a chain and a post for two years straight, never got off, had a half the frozen salmon a day. So he's really, you know, kind of just weak in the muscles. So we just kept working and working for two weeks. I just started training him for two weeks. We went out every day. And then by the time he got back on the river, this one day I looked down my map. I'm like, oh, wow, we are so lost. I'm like, what the heck? We're in a place called Yukon Charlie. That's where the river gets like 20, 30 miles wide. There's all these islands everywhere. And it's really hard to kind of find your way. And I'm like, I think we're lost. And then I realized, oh no, no, this is Moose Island. We're not lost. We just made 60 miles. We started averaging 60 miles. It was, that dog was pulling with his heart. He was like, (laughs) woohoo. It was so exciting to him. And we were just like lightning. And then, um, then what happened, this is a game changer is I'm halfway, you know, across the state by the Arctic circle near a place called Stevens village. And I looked down and I'm like, no, no, there's all this water over the ice. It's called overflow. And I'm like, the ice, it's melting ahead of schedule. I'm like, no, this is the only road I know. I, I can't, I have no other way to continue. This is the frozen Yukon River is my road. So I ended up staying in this Stevens village, this Athabascan village. And the locals were nice enough to give me a little tiny cabin right there on the banks of the river. And, and again, the happenstance. So I'm walking in and out of my door of my cabin and I'm thinking to myself, how am I going to continue? Do I give up? Do I go back home? Do I pick up where I left off next year? I have no other options. And then as that's happening, there's a little snowbank right by my door of my cabin of all the places of all the time. And it starts to melt. And this little green thing is protruding out of it. And I'm like, wait, what is that? And it keeps protruding a little more every day. And then finally I dig out the last canoe built in this, this village 20 years before. And I look at that and I think to myself, oh my gosh, that's it. It's dilapidated. I'm not using that, right? I'm not using that, that canoe. And I also had this little experience where I, during this time waiting to figure out what to do and waiting for the river to break up, um, I did a little side trip down the river to the next village. And I had this incredible experience of where I was being followed by a wolf pack, completely oblivious to it. It wasn't until the, the, uh, the, the estate trooper flying a plane overhead dropped a note saying, hey, there's a wolf pack behind you. And P.S. I'll try to distract, dist- you know, distract them. And the biscuits, yeah, a little bag of biscuits are for your companion, my dog. And the next morning when I went to start early in the morning to get back to Stevens Village to figure out what I was going to do, um, I thought, oh, a wolf pack. Because it, it, was, it was still dark out, right? Because I, I, 
I'd leave early in the morning because the ice and snow is really frozen solid. So I thought, oh, now I have to look behind me to see if the wolf pack's there. And I turn behind me and it's not there. But there's this huge, beautiful amber golden full moon just ready to sink behind the face of the canyon. And I look at that and I'm like, oh, I almost missed that. And then I look uh, above me and I'm like, whoa, wait. And there's this incredible northern lights dancing over my, my, my head. I'm like, oh, look at that. Oh my God, I almost missed that. And then I look ahead where the direction I was going, but I was busy looking at my feet so I wouldn't stumble. And this is a sunrise. So this is a sunrise, northern lights, a full moon, and all the snow and ice is reflecting all those colors. It's like the whole entire world is exploding in beauty. And this is my last day on the ice. I'm like, this is it. This is Mother Nature's gift. This is like the most extraordinary thing. And I'm so taken aback by this beauty that I just do this, thank you. And I hear this, this echo, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm like, whoa. And then I was so ignited by this. I thought, no, man, I'm not giving up. I'm not going home. I'm going to build myself a canoe. So I get back to the village and I go to all the elders and say, hey, I'm going to build a canoe. I'm going to build a canoe. And can I borrow some tools? And word got right back to me. Women don't build canoes. That's just not what we do here. So I had to go back to the elders and say, you don't understand where I come from in California. That's what women do. We're canoe builders. It's like our thing. And they, <laughs> they didn't know how to respond to that. <laughs> and I'm sure there's a few canoe builders, you know, they're female in California. And so then um, I go out, I have my, my new Athabascan friends uh, take me out to the forest, say, what kind of trees do I cut? They told me what kind of trees, I drag them in. And now they're like, oh, she's really going to try to build this canoe. So the elders actually volunteer, Herb, who's a big bellied Athabascan, to sit down and have a fatherly talk with me. So he comes up to me and we're looking over, you know, sitting on the, the, the logs and we're looking over the river and he says, we uh, call you Wonder Woman because of all the miles you can ski in a day, but you build this canoe. And we're going to call you fruitcake. Huh. So I just have to go with the flow. And I laugh. And, and, you know, and so then I start ripping these beautiful 18-foot-long planks of wood. I start hand planting them five days a week, five hours a day. It's very meditative. And they're going by fruitcake, waving at me. And, of course, the kids are emulating this. They're like, fruitcake. And it was really interesting, though, because what did happen that really struck me, and it really hit me in the heart, was the kids came up to me and they looked at me and they're like, what are you doing? And I looked at them and I said, I'm building a canoe like you guys have done for thousands of years. And I realized I was witnessing a break in their culture, the end of the Athabascan culture right there. And I was like, no, no. So the kids came and they'd help me hand plane and we'd talk about it and what the objective is. And here's the, the you know, here's the old canoe. That's what I'm shooting for. And and I made a few little variations on it for rougher waters and stuff. So we both kind of, you know, reignited and rediscovered, you know, the, the skill. But it was sad to see that. I saw a lot of that, right? And, and then what was so beautiful is after two and a half weeks of hand planing, um, I finally had been taking all this wood as I was told to do. And I was putting it into the local muskrat pond where I was submer submerging the wood in the, in the water so it get really pliable. Well, now... I laid all this wood at my feet and I had enough for two and a half boats. And um, I see this glimpse into our humanity and I start to assemble the ribs and the railing and I'm putting it together and all of a sudden they stop coming by going fruitcake. And instead I see them say, I got a C-clamp if you need a C-clamp for that. And then someone else came by saying, hey, I, I got some galvanized screws if you need some. And then someone else came by saying, I, I got some oil-based marine paint. You like blue and red. That would have a massive influence on how I would show up in the world later on in my life, in my community, and my style of leadership. I'm like, that's how humanity works. They think you're crazy. They think you're a fruitcake. But when you actually really start to create something that's like in the physical world, people want to jump on that boat. They want to jump on that train. And that's how we work as a human species. So I, I actually understand that now. So I built that thing in three and a half weeks. I paddle it 900 miles in 11 days. I averaged 75 miles a day and it was no currents, a big river. There's like no, it's just paddling. And I averaged 50,000 strokes a day and I counted because I had nothing better to do. And I did the trip in four months, six days and I was finished and um, filmed it for National Geographic. And I thought the trip was over. Did you have diamond with you in the canoe? So what happened was when I built the canoe, I knew that I couldn't have diamond with me in the canoe because he uh. had claws, right? Uh, and it was a canvas canoe. So I oh, went to the elder, okay. to actually the cap, the, um, the, uh, um, I was going to say the captain, um, to the chief of the village, his name was Randy. And I said, would you please hold on to diamond? And I promise you, I will come back, but I, he will literally 
puncture the, the, the canoe. And I was planning on like paddling a long, long, long days, right? So, and he was not going to sit there just calmly for that. And so um, he, and as I was leaving, as, as I was departing the, the riverbank, as a matter of fact, I, Diamond's off the river, you know, off the bank of ways. And I hear this, and I'm like, I'm coming back, Diamond, I'm coming back. And I, my tears are pouring down my face. I'm coming back, Diamond. I mean, it was, oh my I cried, God. I cried for three days. And so when I finished it, I came back home and I worked, I mean, day in and day out, I worked and I took the film, the footage I had for National Geographic, and I put together a one-woman show that I've been doing for 25 years. And so I had these nine different segments of different pieces of music. And and I did a one-woman show and the, the whole theater was packed. It's this Nevada theater in my hometown of Nevada City. And the place was packed upstairs, down, just standing room only, right? Because they knew how many years been trying and trying and... And they just had this like this kind of like familial pride, like she did it, she, you know. And so the place was packed. Had my show. Next morning, I had cash in my hand. Jumped on the plane, flew into the bush, and brought Diamond back for the second show. Oh wow! And then as soon as I got him back, I realized I made a mistake. He he was a dog of the wild. Oh, okay. didn't know what domesticated cats were and animals. Oh, didn't know what roads were or cars. Right. And within two months, was hit and killed. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. It was brutal. And, and, and it was, it was a, it was a heart stopper. Um, and it was one of the things where I had to kind of come with, to, you know, come to, to, to terms with the fact that he was actually going to be shot and killed the year before. And I gave him the best year of his life and he changed my life too. He changed that whole trip was changed. As soon as I got him, it's like, of course I've got to, I've got to make it. Of course I have to survive. What would happen yeah. to Diamond otherwise? I mean, the yeah. lessons he taught me. <laughs> I mean, the, the the mom instinct, yeah. right? I mean, there's instantaneous. Probably nothing as powerful as that in the no. known universe. Yeah. You know? yeah, I survived it because I had to. What would happen to him if I didn't make it? Yeah, yeah. And so, um, so that was a brutal. That was a brutal ending. It, but in, in fact, that's what I thought. I thought, oh, this is how it's going to end on this note. That's so sad. And as I mentioned before, I realized that later on, it wasn't. It didn't end. It was actually, the journey was just beginning in many ways, which we can get into shortly. <laughs> what a cool story. I'm so glad I indulged myself in the, in the audience with that. I just, I love stories. It's my yeah. last name, you know what I mean? Right, right. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's just so, I'm just, the whole time you're telling it, I'm thinking of, of course, putting myself in that position. Like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at no leg of that trip, did I think, yeah, I could do that. <laughs> I was like, holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> She might be a fruitcake. This sounds crazy. But man, it's so cool. Thank you for thank you for sharing that. I've spent money on a grip of supplements from literally dozens of companies over the past 25 years. And one of the best companies I've found is Activation Products. I trust these guys because they're all about giving people definitive information, the best raw quality material, then letting you decide for yourself what works best for your body. I use many of their products on a daily basis, but my favorite has always been their marine phytoplankton product called Oceans Alive. It's the purest, most potent marine phytoplankton supplement in the world. It's fresh, raw, and pure. It's made using a scientifically proven natural method of stabilization that doesn't need any heat, cold, freeze drying, or any processing at all. All they do is add the freshly harvested marine phytoplankton to a pure concentrated sea mineral solution that instantly stabilizes each cell in its perfect condition with freshness waiting to be consumed. So it's 100% raw and natural. And the nutrient density of this microalgae is bananas. There's literally nothing like it on the planet. It provides you with a vast array of vitamins, minerals, essential fatty acids, and amino acids. Plus, its natural antioxidant content reduces oxidative stress, promotes healthy cellular growth and development, and it boasts incredible cognitive and mental benefits. It's actually noticeable to me the moment I put a few drops under my tongue. To give it a try yourself and to fill your brain light up instantly, you can get a one-time 15% off discount at activationproducts.com using the code LUKE. That's activationproducts.com, and the one-time code is LUKE. You went on to become very socially and politically involved in your town mm -hmm. of uh, Nevada City, which mm -hmm. I've been to once. It's a beautiful, beautiful town. Um, Northern California. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I was staying in Tahoe. And sure. so, you know, hop, skip, and a jump from there. 
Uh, and a company that I work with called Amp Coil is oh, uh, based there. Yeah, yeah. Aaron. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I know they're them. based there yeah, too. So yeah. they're, they're, those are the only people I actually know there, except uh, now you. <laughs> so you eventually become mayor uh-huh. of Nevada City uh-huh. uh, for what, two terms? Two terms. I was city council member for eight years and in, in, in two of those years I was mayor and also, okay. then also vice mayor too. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then um, in 2011... You co-founded Sierra Roots, mm-hmm. a homeless advocacy organization, mm-hmm. launching the county's first extreme weather shelter mm-hmm. for the homeless. That's right. Tell us a little bit about that. I, lo- I love your history because you've done so much meaningful public service. Mm-hmm. And now where we're going to go in this conversation, <laughs> we were talking about this earlier, like some people could deem you, you know, a right wing extremist or something because you've been very outspoken about your views mm-hmm. about the convid um mm-hmm. as have i mm-hmm. but in in reading all this stuff about you i'm like this is like the most progressive <laughs> person that you know this is like a classical yeah, yeah. liberal yeah. kind of person that yeah. gets involved in and yeah. is actually doing things yeah. meaningfully yeah. um and consciously in their community yeah so what was that um sierra roots project about sierra roots so what happened was um you know, I, and we'll get into another story later, but uh, my objective was in 2004, um, I was really concerned with the, the the plight of the world, the direction we were going in. And now 2004 feels like the good old days, right? The irony. And I thought, well, what can I possibly do? I'm one person. You know, I can't change the world. And then I thought, well, look, at if you're going to make a difference, start in your own hometown for Pete's sake. And I, I read the book, The Tipping Point, you know, and right. and then, of course, later on, like even Power Versus Force and stuff like that. And and I thought, you know what, just change your community, just make your community what you want to see in the world. And so what happened was we had a, a homeless shelter that would close during the summer times and our homeless population was rising. And I thought, this is awful that in the summertime they have to go off and fend for themselves again. So I decided to do a um, kind of a public outreach uh, project that would kind of really galvanize the community and and really focus on the fact that we don't have a, a homeless shelter 24-7 all year long. And so um, we, I got over 100 volunteers together. And in two days, we, we built a fleet of micro houses on wheels for the homeless. And I actually spent the next three years hauling out into the woods, the forest, wherever they were, you know, if they're willing to accept it. And um, and so we built 40 of these. And they had like these big, huge wooden, almost like Flintstone wheels and rickshaw handles and and corrugated tin roof that, that opened up and had mosquito netting and a little shelf inside, and enough room for your stuff at your, the foot of of this little micro house or for your dog delay. And, uh, and once we did that, I was working with a woman named Janice O'Brien and I'm like, we need to do more than this, you know? And our objective was to get away from the homeless shelter model and actually create a homeless village, right? Where people could live and work and, and we can help them, you know, rebuild their own skills and their own sense of purpose and, and give them wraparound services that they needed. And so we started Sierra Roots. And, and then what happened was we had one of our local indigenous people freeze and die under one of our, our overpasses in our little town in Nevada city. And that just hit us in the heart really hard. And I thought this is messed up. I can't believe this happened on our watch, on our guard. So at that point in time, there's a lot of outcry throughout the community. I was upset and we're like, okay, that's it. We're going to, we're going to start an extreme weather shelter. So this is never, ever happens again. And when we started, it was like, just got into Facebook saying, okay, I need bags. I need mats. I need kennels for the dogs. We're going to do it tonight. And we had to, it was a battle for years to get the county to support it, to get the city to support it. And it was highly controversial. And it was a little bit of the wild west at first, right? There weren't many house rules and things like that. And and now it's, you know, and, and you, <laughs> we'd sit there all night long, kind of, you know, trying to keep my eyes open with a toothpick on a cold metal chair, just trying to, you know, watch everybody. And it was a little hairy, right? But but now it's it's a regular thing and the county supports it and the city supports it. And it's wow. not even a question. Wow. Yeah. That's that's super cool. Yeah. It just goes to show sometimes good ideas stick. Sometimes they do. Well, um, I want to maybe fast forward a bit because there's a few nuanced mm-hmm. uh, accomplishments that I, I think are interesting and I could dive into, but I don't want to miss out on some of the current affairs and i'm right. going to try to put this one out as quickly as i can because mm-hmm. when i cover things about the world today it changes so fast i know if it's my usual six to eight week lead time by the time that happens <laughs> the trucker convoy is history or whatever you know um i know right but as, as you're as you're serving as as mayor of this small town mm-hmm. and um you start seeing the reports of what was happening uh in wuhan and you know all of these people just collapsing like zombies in the street and 
then people are being boarded into these housing projects and encampments and things like that. Um, when did you start to become aware as, as a mayor that something was off with this? Well, in January, I became aware of it and almost obsessed with like, what is this in January? And in fact, um, I was never concerned about SARS or MERS or H1N1, never was worried about any kind of pandemic, to be honest. Um, and this really captured my attention fast. And what shocked me was how the government was responding. I'm like, wait a second. And watching people fall over and they're boarding people up in their apartments. I'm like, what is this? And and so I'd go to the city and county. In fact, I went into my, my city manager saying, do you know this thing called coronavirus? Have you guys been paying it? I'm like, we got to prepare because they're right over the pond from us, essentially. And if it's that virulent, we need to be ready. And my partner, Susan, and I got our H1, I mean, got our um, N95 masks and we were even kind of self-quarantining. And and I remember, and I was running for city council for my third term, as a matter of fact. And there's this one day we're having our parade, which was the last parade Nevada City had. I was going to be out there in the parade, promote, you know, I'm running for city council. And I stayed home. And I listened to the cheers and the drums and the, and the marching band. And I'm hearing this sound and I'm crying. I'm like, that might be the last time I hear that sound for a long time. And I didn't want to go into the public because I'm like, if it's that deadly, we might be infecting each other. Did not know anything, knew nothing, right? And I'm trying to warn the county and the city, like, hey guys, there's this thing. It was really surreal actually. And like, oh, that's okay. And now I kind of understand why they're a little bit, maybe a little slow to, to be concerned. I, I kind of feel they may have been, I don't know, maybe they, I don't know. It was just weird that they weren't responding very quickly. So Finally, what happened was in March, um, the county is catching on, the city is catching on. And then March, we have uh, our governor, Newsom, make his state home order, which at the time is the mayor. And I signed a declaration of emergency. I'm like, look, at, I'm, I'm a risk taker. I have no problem with risk. But this is where we have to be extra cautious because we do not know what we're dealing with. And so I signed a declaration of emergency. The state home, uh, home orders happen. I'm good with that. And then what happens is that we have all of our meetings now on Zoom, right? And we have these weekly Friday meetings with all the, the county officials, the health department, the city managers, the mayors. And I'm like, this is good. We're on the same page. You know, make sure we're all, you know, on the same narrative and we're talking the same talk. And, and once we get the, we go beyond predictive models and get into the raw data, then we can adjust ourselves accordingly. And, um, but what happened was... Um, uh, we started having these weekly meetings and, and I'm looking at the data. I'm watching the Johns Hopkins University updates every single day, right? I'm watching, I'm looking at the data and then the data comes in and it's not so bad. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we should, you know, by the skin of our teeth, we're okay. And so what happens though, is I'm in these Zoom calls quietly behind the, you know, the scenes and I'm seeing some distressing things. First of all, what they're saying to us behind the scenes versus what they're putting on the official county website and what they're saying publicly was very different. So I already saw from the get-go that they're sending out mixed information, which is not a good thing to do, right? They're telling us one thing, but they're telling the public a different thing. And, and then, so then we're seeing that the, the, the data come in. I'm like, hey guys, it's not so bad. And I start asking questions like, oh no, no, just stay on the same track. And I could tell by that time that they wanted everyone with a jab. It was very, very evident that, that was the end goal. And I kept asking, what's the end goal? What's the metrics? What are we shooting for? And when I would do this, the CEO of our county would actually mute me, ignore me, or say, Renette, you're asking too many questions, which was actually more than two questions. Wait till the meeting's over. And then afterwards, we'll answer your, your, deep, your deep dive questions. And then they just dogpile me and, and then, you know, send me away. And um, so Is this- it, I mean, you, you have to think at, at this point that like, where are the directives coming from when it's when it it all began to roll out universally across the planet, right? And and different, not only like in one town, but it's like every town in California okay. does the same thing. It's like who's dictating that? That's well, what always. Well, and there's it, another component we never talk about because most people aren't aware of. But what I was doing as the mayor was I would drive around my town at three, four, or five in the morning. I'd drive around the county just to see what was going on in the middle of the night. And I see these utility trucks rolling into town three in the morning, four in the morning, extending the fiber optics. And they disappear by the time, you know, six o'clock rolled around. And I, I talked, I've talked to people around the country and the world. Same thing happened globally. Do you know how much planning and cost and organizing that takes to do that something, do something like that on a dime? So when you talk about this is happening globally, there's something else happening. They were rolling out the backbone of, you know, broadband, right? I'm, I'm fiber optics. I'm not opposed to fiber optics. I'm not opposed to broadband, but that's not what this was about. Because what happened was when everyone came out of their stay at home orders, 
everywhere across the United States, all across the world, including Ireland and Israel, they came out and all of a sudden there's antennas everywhere. Who made that order? Who organized that? We don't talk about that. So, yeah, really I, interesting. I, I saw quite a bit of that in the alternative media, you know, someone well, just citizen reporters going, Hey, yeah, they're like yeah. in the middle of the oh, night yeah. or, in, you schools, know, on a Sunday, just schools. all of a sudden doo, 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 yes. all these 5G towers going that up. That takes a lot of planning and funding and hiring and organizing and, and getting all the materials. And it takes a lot of time, way takes, ahead of time. Why right? right? doesn't just spontaneously erupt? So, yeah. okay. Yeah. So now what's happening is that I'm getting really concerned because we are not pivoting according to the information coming in. I'm like, what is going on? And I know who I am. I'm, I call out corruption. I don't care where it is. I just call it out. I'm a truth teller and I've got a loud voice and I'm willing to make a stand because I know most people don't have the backbone. I've got that. So I'm like, I'll use it. So I see Gavin Newsom make this annou announcement that's statewide, statewide mandate. And I'm thinking to myself, how is that? That's not how laws are made. That's not how legislation is made. And that's not the job of a governor. So I go down to my police chief, I walk right down to city hall and say, Hey, Chad, I want to know, do you intend on enforcing this? And he says to me, I don't know how it doesn't come with a penal code. You can't enforce something without a penal code. I'm like, thanks. He goes, and it doesn't look very constitutional to me. I'm like, thank you very much. So I sit and I go back home. I'm online. I'm looking for the media. I'm looking for the radio. I'm looking for the newscasters to say, Hey, a governor can't do this. And it's silent. And I'm thinking, Oh no. I'm going to have to resort to my Facebook page, which I have done on a few occasions. And I've made a big stir in my town. I don't need to tell anybody that. They can Google that. And so I'm like, okay, this is what I have to do. So I go and I grab a Peggy Hall, the Healthy American video, where she does a beautiful job of explaining how legislation is made. I'm like, thank you for doing that. I get that post and then I do this post like, hey, just so you know, I'm paraphrasing. As you go about your day, just know that, um, you know, um, Gavin Newsom is not king, you know, governors can't make laws and you can, you know, you can breathe freely. <clears throat> and I knew that was going to create a bit of a storm, but I'm like, I'm just telling you all the truth. This is not how it works, especially during a state of emergency. During a state of emergency, this is actually the responsibility of elected officials to make sure that we abide by the constitution and not go down the slippery slope. And I'm watching us go down a really fast slippery slope at that time. And of course, as you can well imagine, all hell broke out. The phone calls came in, the emails came in, people were like, we love her, we hate her, shut her up, no, speak, you know. The newscast came, you know, and now people- And you're are, mayor at I'm this mayor. time? Wow. Have you heard of colostrum? Well, it's been one of my top superfoods for the past decade. It's likely one of the best tasting and definitely most nutrient dense and novel foods on the planet. My personal colostrum of choice has always been Sir Thrival. They sent me their three new flavors of colostrum this week, and of course I immediately opened all three jugs and made a drink of each with only spring water as the base, and they were insanely good. Just rich, creamy, delicious. I'm now, of course, obsessed. The new flavors are enhanced with organic cacao powder, strawberry juice powder, and organic vanilla. And I gotta say, even their plain, unflavored colostrum was already addictively delicious, so the new flavors are, for me, just an added bonus. What I like about colostrum, in addition to it being such a delicious ingredient in just about any smoothie you can dream of, is that it also provides protein and immune factors in their natural whole food form. So much so, in fact, that it's often referred to as immune milk. And for those of you that like studies, the studies have shown that colostrum is three times more powerful than the vaccine against flu virus. So this might just be nature's best pandemic prevention supplement. Plus, it also aids digestion and is often used in cases of leaky gut, IBS, Crohn's, and ulcerative colitis. And Sir Thrival has set the standard for the highest quality USA-sourced grass-fed colostrum available. You can think of Sir Thrival colostrum as a supercharged protein powder, but more functional and sophisticated. But not so sophisticated that kids won't eat it. In fact, kids actually love it. And when I have one, this will likely be the first food they eat after mom's milk. You can get your colostrum now at SirThrival.com and use the code Luke for 10% off your order. That's S-U-R-T-H-R-I-V-A-L. Sir Thrival, like survive and thrive at the same time. SirThrival.com. And again, the code is Luke. God, that's crazy. It's not like you're just a rogue pissed off woman you know, or someone questioned. I mean, you're in charge of some stuff. I am. And I was right. Yeah. That is not, that's, he's not, that's not his authority. They should have actually been focusing the cameras on him. 
but they're focusing on me. And so, and I'm not going to back down. I believe in telling the truth and I've got very thick skin. So I'm going to just hold the line and um, the the haters are going to hate and the lovers are going to love. And so now by this time, I've already been elected for my third term. We are now on July 8th and I'm still the mayor, ready to step down, take my oath of office for my third term as council member. And as my partner, Susan can tell you, it was several weeks of me going, I think I have to resign because I'm not going to shut up. And my town is so tiny and my city hall is so small. They're taking the crosshairs. They're just getting left and right. They can't even do their job. They're just answering the emails and the phone calls. It's not good for city hall. And I think that me truth telling and calling out these uncomfortable truths is more important right now in this current atmosphere than me being a mayor. And also the climate had changed so much in my town. There's like so many incoming missiles that were out of the, the purview of my, my community and my, my job as mayor that I was like, I have to pivot. I, have to, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I have to come at this completely different and it can't be at this level. And I didn't even know what that was yet. So here I am on my Zoom call. I'm the mayor ready to step down and take my oath. And instead I read my resignation letter and uh, the cities, I mean, I see the council members just whip their heads up. They're like, what? Cause you know, this town is my everything. This town is like, this is how we're going to change the world is by me investing in my community. And I was letting go of my baby. I was, it was, it was a, it was a, it was a big thing for me. And I was investing in this community because I believe if we go into hard times, it's going to be us. It's going to be our networks. It's going to be our neighbors. It's going to be our farms. It's going to be all of us. We're the ones who are going to survive the hard times. And I was letting it go. Never thought I'd do that. And so I, I say to my council members, which I'm sure they still don't like me to this day, so I have to leave you with a story. There's a gentleman by the name of Dr. Leonard Hardell who's well known for convincing the World Health Organization after years of collecting empirical evidence and studies that Agent Orange is a cancer-causing agent. And once they said, yes, it is, he went around, they went around to all the heads of the different chemical companies and, and said, stop spraying Agent Orange. And the, the heads of the companies that did not stop spraying, they hauled them into the international courts and, and started prosecuting them for crimes against humanity. And in order to um, identify who was committing these crimes against humanity, there's only one question you have to ask, which is, what did you know by when? So I said to my city council, we're going to come back because you have enough information right now to know better. This is July of 2020. You have enough information right now to know better, to stop doing what you're doing. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to come back and I'm going to hold your feet to the fire to the highest extent of the law. And we're going to charge you guys for crimes against humanity. And I left. (laughs) Oh my God. That's a mic drop of all mic drops. So when when you mention yeah. these crimes against humanity, I'm trying to think of the timeline there. I mean, we're force masking kids, uh, waiting for right? waiting for the job, closing down businesses, Everything. right? Just oh, yeah. all of this yeah. stuff that yeah. is yeah. illogical yeah. and yeah. unconstitutional. But in we weren't many even cases. forcing the children yet to wear the masks. Oh, okay. Really big time. It's more okay. like adults and businesses and close the businesses. And, and that was enough to fire you up, even that. Because, because it's gotten it, so much worse. Right, you know, right. And, know. and it wasn't necessary. And it wasn't, it wasn't, it's just like, you guys, we have other options. And did you know about the, the uh, lack of efficacy with masks and the possible harm that they could actually cause well, people wearing them? And you know, interesting, because I was a house painter for decades and I, I have what's called industrial bronchitis, hence the cough, you know? Um, and so what happened was I was wearing my N95 mask incorrectly many times, wasn't fitted to my face, or I'd pop a dirty one on. Oh, it's better than nothing. Well, actually it wasn't. And so now I have permanently damaged my lungs, lungs. So I say to people like, look at, you may not know this, but if you wear a mask improperly or it's dirty or it's like got bacteria inside, you can actually do damage. This is not good. And we... The masses should not be wearing masks 24-7 or eight hours a day or 10 hours a day. It's just we have other alternatives. Even then, I was saying we've got vitamin D, we've got vitamin C, we've got zinc tablets. Go out, you know, and that's what I was saying to our health department at that time. They're like, because they said to me when I would challenge them, they'd say, Renette, um, until we have high herd immunity, you can expect more of the same. That's when I was asking, like, what's the goal here? And I said, well, if you want herd immunity, you need acquired herd immunity. And if that's the case, should we let people going out into the sun now, vitamin D, get out of their homes, you know, grow food, get their hands in the soil. You know, we can distribute you know, C and D. And, and, and then finally, we had another doctor in these Zoom calls say, well, Renette, until we have zero cases. I'm like, when do we ever have zero cases of anything? None of this is making sense. And so, um, so at that point in time, I thought, okay. And I said to the city council when I resigned, I'm stepping down to step up. 
didn't know even what that meant. But I thought, okay, at that point in time, there was just this complete broad silence across the world. Like, I'm like, where are the doctors? Where are the nurses? Where are the, where are the virologists and the experts? I know there's more to it than just masking and social distancing. There's not a lot of science behind that that, you know, really backs it up. It was very quiet. So I thought, well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go on YouTube and I'm going to start interviewing experts in the respective fields and I'm going to bring them to the table basically and they'll share that with my community and anyone else in the world who wants to hear their opinions so they can make educated decisions. That is actually the job of an elected official is to inform the public. That's what our elected officials should be doing, but they were not. So as a citizen, I'm going to do it without you know putting my city hall into the crosshairs. So I went onto YouTube, started Renette Sinem's Chew on This, and when I interviewed Sherry Tenpenny, it went viral. She was the first time anyone talked about the mechanisms of injury. And I got millions of hit and immediately YouTube Of the took, inoculations. Yeah, yeah. YouTube took me down. I listened to that one, by the way, and we'll link to that. It's on uh, BitChute, BitChute, I think. Online, yeah, I'll, We'll link to that in the show notes, which again, people can find at lukestory.com slash wake the bear. The Sherry Tenpenny, I mean, I've heard her here and there. She's definitely one of... The outspoken heroes of, yeah, <laughs> of she s- is saving the humanity at the moment. But that interview that you did with her is crazy, and that was even a little earlier well, that on. Was er- right? That was that was in the summer of twenty twenty. That's when they the first fall, started rolling it out. Fall of twenty twenty, and then we did another one in January, and and then I interviewed people, you know, like um, OSHA experts on the masks, right? A Dr. David Martin, a Dr. Carrie Midday, Attorney Lee Dundas, you know, um, a, a professor. Professor uh, Dolores Cahill in Ireland, uh, Dr. Peter McCullough. These are people who just weren't even, people didn't know about them yet. And I was getting their names, my mama warriors who were on the front line saying, Renette, and they fed me. Renette, you need to interview this person, Renette. And I just, we'd contact them and we'd interview them. And then what happened was I was, I was on the high wire, Del Big Trees, the high wire, about me stepping down and how there's no other elected officials in the state of California. You know, almost 40 million people, nobody was calling him out. It's like I was this little lone wolf out there. I'm like, okay, guys, back up. Now's the time to back me up. And there's nobody. And so I get people reaching out saying, you should run for governor. And I'm like, absolutely not. I will not be doing that anytime ever. And, um, and, and I got a lot of that. And then I had some folks reach out to me. Um, who uh, were interesting, you know, they've been involved in the California political scene. And then I, I was talking to them mostly not to talk about running for governor, but just really to talk about what are you seeing? Because am I losing my mind here? And, um, and then after conversations about it, you know, and just watching the political climate, waiting, waiting for people to speak up and wake up. I'm like, oh, yo, yo, I think I have to like really, really step up. So I was talking to to the two individuals who were asking me to run. I just said, you know, I said, I have a really good life. And in fact, my partner, Susan, and I are actually test driving RVs right now. And we just might go right off into the sunset because I don't know if there's anything else I can do. And I can do my podcast from anywhere in the world. So I can just keep doing them and just go off and enjoy the rest of my life. But if you really want me to actually run for governor, it has to be extraordinary. Because I, there's other people can just do more of the same. And I'm not going to do more of the same. So if you guys are willing to uh, support me in not running with a party affiliation whatsoever, because ever since Citizens United decision came down from the Supreme Court, big money's infiltrated our politics. Our government is dead. The two-party system is absolutely corrupt. It's not matter who you get, red or, red or blue, you will get more of the same. Two-headed snake. It's a two-headed snake. It's yeah. a different wing yeah. of the same bird. And this is the biggest thing I can that's stress. What's so, that's what's so frustrating to me is that, as I was kind of joking earlier about, you 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 could be labeled like a right wing extremist, you know, just because you're a fucking normal person who just values freedom. But it's we get so caught up I in know. the left and right and Republican Democrat thing, and it's like if you zoom out just ten thousand feet, even you can see like, does anything really ever change? I mean, think about who's president, yeah. right? It's like different. Different shades of gray. Yeah, I mean, you, you've had a couple, you know, you have, okay, way back when women were allowed to vote. Fucking awesome. Uh, fast forward a couple few decades, um, gay people can get married. Awesome. You know, it's like you have a couple moves mm-hmm. toward the mm-hmm. liberty of people and the betterment of society. But the, I mean, you can like name them on one hand, things that have actually been meaningful in terms of a positive impact with, you know, widespread legislation, right? That matters. That's right. And it's just like, it doesn't matter if it's Trump, Obama, well, Hillary. You, I mean, it's just, it's all the same stuff. When you look at the Republicans and the Democrats and who's investing in their campaigns, it's the exact same companies. 
Right. It's Sex like when you evil. look at, because we'll be polarized. Oh, I'm, I like Fox or CNN, right? And then you look, BlackRock. You know what I mean? Right. It's like the same right. multinational right. corporations, these right. bloated, seemingly unstoppable corporations own all of well, the media and they're creating the narrative. And some people um, like David Icke, for one that I interviewed, even said, and I had a hard time at, at that moment thinking that, but that they even like, if not created Trump, at least if at, at best, or at the very least, allowed him to get in and do that thing, right? Because they right. just wanted the disruption and they wanted to trick this whole kind of segment of the population to think they had they had a win, right? Yes. But like, if yeah. you look at the aftershock yeah. of what happened, it's like, dude rolled out vaccines. I mean, he just, I know. we're in much I worse know. shape, you know? I know. So he, after all of that, I was like, I don't know, maybe they were right. Not like I was a big Trump guy, but I, I did like, I want to say I was a Trump guy at all per se, but... I did like that things were getting shaken up and that the, the mainstream media was being exposed and it was just, at least it was different. You know what I mean? Um, it, was, and, it was, it was monkey wrenching. It seemed like it was monkey yeah. wrenching the system. Somewhere. Yeah. So yeah, I thought it was good or bad. It was monkey whether wrenching. or not like I liked that particular person's yeah. personality and some of the things that they'd said and you know, all that very immature and egotistical and stuff. But yeah. I, I did like that. Well, Hey, even if this whole thing blows up in our face, at least the status quo is being diminished. Yeah. But then, you know, here we are and it's like, no, the status quo is kind of still there. Only things are actually way more polarized mm -hmm, and worse. Mm -hmm, so you mm -hmm. can see from that point of view that perhaps those oligarchs behind the scenes do orchestrate all of this and give us the perception of choice because we won't question our slavery if right. we don't know that That's we're right. slaves. It's, it's it, 100%. You don't fight for freedom if you don't know you're enslaved. And it's total war games, right? Because the bankers always invest on both sides of a war. Well, what do you think? what do you think we're in right now? So they've invested on both sides. So either way, either side you vote for, you voted for more war. And I tell people, you can sit there and you can vote for, for a Republican right now, governor in California, and you're just going to get a, you're going to, you're going to get a red Newsom versus right now you got a blue Newsom. You know, it's like, you're just going to get more of the same. It's impossible. It's, don't even kid yourselves, folks. And this is the biggest message to get out there is as long as you continue to vote for a Democrat and a Republican, you are guaranteed more of the same. And you have to ask yourself, do I want more of this? <laughs> Boy, I hope no one in California thinks they want more of that. I hope so too. I'm and so pissed at, at these demons that have ruined such a great state. You know, I well, lived in California most of my life and I, I just, know. I literally like felt like I had to flee. It was almost like a, you're not alone, a refugee kind of escape. Even I was texting with my dad today about, the arduous journey of renovating a house. He said, well, I bet you'll never do that again. And I said, well, probably not, but I'm just glad I got out of California. And no offense to people still living there. I mean, no, it's, I, I it's love brutal. California. It's, it's, it's really hard. And, it's and you, you, crazy. You, you realize how hard it is when I mean, you get back into it. Especially it, LA. I yeah. mean, it just, that was yeah. LA and San Francisco, yeah. maybe yeah. the epicenters of all things that have gone wrong um, right. politically in California. Right. I know there's many places that are still inhabitable. Yeah, you know? no, it's true. And you <laughs> but, know, it's very true. And, and, you know, and we just try to let people know that, you know, this is the moment. This is the moment. This is the time that we make the great leap of faith. You know, we have to. This is it. If we don't do it now, if you think things are tough now, just wait. And so um, I think people are really starting to realize it. I think the young people who voted for Biden are like, wait, you're not going to forgive our student loans and instead you're going to give us crack pipes? I mean, that's the reality. It's like, yeah, that's what it looks like. So People are really waking up really fast. Like, oh my Lord. It's like, welcome to the party. There you go. The buy, so, like the buyer's remorse crowd. Yeah, right? it's a buyer's remorse. That yeah, it's sad. realizing they got duped. They got duped, you yeah, know, and the whole yeah. system is meant to dupe us. So, so I just, <clears> so, so when we were talking about me running for governor, it's like, look it, I'm going to, but I'm very, because Citizens United, I've been aware of it since the 2010 when the, that court decision came down and, and, and most people didn't even I've never attention. heard of it. So Citizens United is is a non-party, non-partisan. No, 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 no. Citizens United is, the Supreme Court said, basically, your campaign contributions as a corporation is equivalent to for freedom of speech, the First Amendment right. So your campaign dollars is considered a First Amendment right. It is, 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 it is free speech. And as soon as that happened, they infiltrated okay. the campaigns, right? And they started infiltrating all of politics, all of campaigns. So this is how a George Soros can move into. That's right. Uh, so basically big right. money literally co-opted. It was a coup. It was a monetary coup, Got essentially. It. Okay. Okay. And they took over. So people are wondering what happened to our representatives? They're bought, they're paid for.
And I know for a fact, because I'm talking to these folks, my campaign team is talking to them. We have people in LA who are Republican, who have no competition in their district of any other uh, Republican. They're pushing the dial just a tiny little bit. And the GOP on the official website is removing them just because they're trying to push the dial a tiny bit. If you do not toe the line, that's what I'm saying to folks, like, look at guys, with the party comes money, it comes infrastructure, it comes donor base, all these great things, right? But you have to sell your soul. You can never represent the people in the party. It's impossible. The system is structured for that. So when I was talking to this folks saying, I'll run, but no party affiliation, which comes with its own challenges. You know, you don't have the big money, you don't have the donors, you don't have the structure there. But I'm, I'm not, I, anything else is, is a joke. It's a, it's a facade. So there is that piece. And there's another important piece. As a person who's been in the foxhole, in the trenches for almost 20 years now, I've been doing all this incredible work with the community, and yet I see our community and our world just backsliding and backsliding and getting worse. I'm like, what is going on? Why is it getting worse? Why is our constitution getting eviscerated? So I said to the, the, to the two folks, I said, look at guys, I'm willing to do this, but there has to be something at the foundation of this campaign. And I told them the story about the seventh generation principle, which a lot of people still don't know about. In fact, there's seven generations and it's a, it's a, you know, eco product. That's how people are familiar with it. Oh, right, right. They don't realize there's something more. So the laundry soap, the laundry (laughs) soap, you know, the, the, the paper towels. I said, our constitution, most people don't realize was inspired by the six nations of the Iroquois Confederacy, the Iroquois, the indigenous people inspired our forefathers. They were like, you guys are so brilliant. We're going to take that. And they did. And they made the constitution. And it was not until 1988, the constitu- the, uh, the Congress and the, the, uh, the Senate actually gave the, the Iroquois their due, their due credit saying, thank you for inspiring this beautiful constitution. So we have that piece, but also what people don't realize is the, the Iroquois, their constitution, this beautiful vessel came with two important components that every vessel has to have an anchor and a compass. And the compass is that seven generation principle. Every decision you make today should serve seven generations from now. That's the metrics. That's the measurement. That's how we measure ourselves in our own lives and our leaders and their decision making. And then the compass is, okay, we have the elders who are now locked away in nursing homes. What we do is we take those elders and we let them look back on the last few generations, fold in that wisdom over the generations into the decision making today to ensure for the next seven generations. And it's that kind of wind that you fill, fill into your cells that continues the boat to propel towards that particular shore, right? And so, so, so we can create a contract for Californians. That's a blueprint for California that's based on that principle. I'll jump in, you know, as everyone's running out of the burning house, I'll run in. But it has to have, that's my prerequisite essentially, is like no party affiliation and it's got to be the seven generation principle because I want us to have a common goal. I want to stop the, the party division. I want to stop the caustic words. I want to stop the weaponization of our world. And I want to make sure that our children have a future, period. And they're like, game's on. I'm like, oh boy. (laughs) So we actually read Newt Gingrich's contract with Americans. We read Ice Cube's contract with Californians. Read those, got inspired, created a contract with Californians. It's a 30-page blueprint. It's beautiful too. I I skim read it today in preparation for this. Yeah, it's a powerful document. It is, and it's a living yeah. document. We have a second iteration coming, right? Because because it, it, because my whole thing for my canoe story is I believe in the collective genius. I'll have an idea. I'll think, oh, it's, it's a great idea. But when I let people pile on their wonderful ideas, right, it always outshoots my wildest dreams. So this is that was just like the fundamental start, right? So we already have better ideas, more beautiful, more powerful programs and stuff like that to put in there. But it's based on that seven generation principle. So, um, so we worked on that, and that was that was in October of 2020. We started working on that, and and I was going to run for the recall, and um, and then as the recall got nearer and nearer, it looked like it was a big old boondoggle. I'm like, no, I'm not doing this. This does not look. This looks like don't even bother. So we pulled out and just focused on. June of 2020, which most Californians have no idea, go ahead and ask them that in less than three months, they're getting ballots to vote for a new governor. And the press, the media is not even covering this, which I find fascinating as Governor Newsom is backpedaling. Oh, do we really want masks? Oh, do we really want to close businesses? Did I say that? And the media is keeping it very quiet that there's even an election coming around. I can't help but just note that. In 2022. In 2022 right now. Coming coming up. up In a few months. Yeah. Right. So, so it's interesting how the media 
because think about it, three months before the recall in California, it was, oh, you know, Caitlyn Jenner, oh, Larry Elders. That's all you heard about, right? Recall, recall, recall. And now we're three months out. There's this huge, four, this, I mean, this is a primary, right? This is for the next four years. And the media is barely covering it. Fascinating. Wow. <laughs> so what I think is happening, from what I can tell, is that the elected, our elected officials in California and our governor are trying to backpedal and like, oh, did, did we say that? Were, were we locking you down? Were, were, I'm sorry, were we destroying your lives and your, your children's future? Was that me? And they're going to backpedal all that and kind of, you know, just pull it in and then go, oh, by the way, I'm running again. <laughs> you know, we have very short memories. So I think this is the game they're playing. By now, most of us are clued into the fact that gut health is fundamental to so many other aspects of our health. But did you know that your dog's gut is just as important to theirs? Any of the following could point to an issue with your dog's gut health. Surprisingly smelly gas or poop, diarrhea that's difficult to pick up, unusually bad breath, persistent tear strains, hair loss, or itchy skin, and behavior like separation anxiety, aggression, or hyperactivity. As the largest immune barrier in a dog's body, it doesn't take much to knock their gut microbiome out of whack. Habits like eating wheat, corn, and soy found in so many commercial dog foods, as well as eating poop, ew, gross, I know, but they do it, eating garbage or dead animals, emotional distress like thunderstorms, being boarded, separation anxiety, etc., sudden dietary changes, antibiotics, GI infections, and pesticides that linger in food, water, dirt, and the grass they play on. The best solution to this issue I've found is called Just Pets Probiotic from Just Thrive, which is what I feed our dog Cookie. According to research, your dog's naturally harsh stomach acid, which is necessary for digesting all types of foods, kills off 99.99% of the probiotic strains available on the market. And womp womp, that means most doggy probiotic products die long before their active strains get to the intestines. But Just Thrive's unique spore-based probiotic strains are designed by nature to arrive 100% alive in the intestines where they can support digestive, behavioral, and immune system health in your pup. So to get your dog's gut sorted out, hop over to justthrivehealth.com and use the code LUKE15 at checkout. Again, that's justthrivehealth.com and use the code LUKE15 for 15% off their entire website. Now, I was talking to a guy here who was in politics in Texas a number, like you know, a couple decades ago, and I forget if he was running to be a senator or something like that, but he was telling me how when he reached a certain level of success, an achievement, whatever that was, I forget what distinction or title he had, but he said that he was kind of shown mm. in order to be part of that club mm -hmm. and get into the upper echelon mm -hmm. that it was dark. You know, he didn't go into specifics, but he's, you know, he's uh, alluding to- Was he an American? Or American he... guy, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, he, you know, I think we were talking about the rampant mm -hmm. pedophilia in the yeah. world and Jeffrey Epstein and all of that stuff and how- politicians are compromised and you know get blackmailed and things like that yeah. and and yeah. i was kind of poking him for like is any of that stuff true and essentially what he said is at a certain level right you're not going to get further unless you are part more, of the team yeah unless you are compromised in some way i wonder i wonder if you know the future legacy that you're describing and envisioning and, and acting toward with without the Republican Democrat thing. I, you know, I'm curious as to how this is going to perhaps emerge with an upswell of public support and that right. so many of us have realized we got duped. We're, we're duped. I mean, I was never political, but I would have always considered myself a liberal. And I'm like, right. if I look at the far left now, I'm like, I'm definitely not that. I know. But I'm also not some fundamentalist, you know, nope. white supremacist or whatever. I know. The, you I'm know, not either. I'm not, you Whatever can't, the extremes yeah. are, I'm like, yeah. I actually just want people to be free and happy and mm -hmm. follow and the- And healthy and right. Follow the golden rule. I mean, it's not that complicated, you know? It's not that complicated. And, you know, and I say to people, I'm like, look at California has everything it needs to turn it around. We have everything. We've got the resources. We've got the intelligence. We've got the money. We're fifth largest economy in the world still. We've got the only thing we're lacking is the leadership. And I agree. I, it is a club. And so we know that. So the thing is, we know how elections can turn out. So we have a we have a multi-pronged approach here at this campaign. We're not putting all of our eggs in the, the gubernatorial basket, right? So it's like, okay, if we win, we're going to kick butt. 
we're going to make sure the buck stops with me at my desk when bad bills come through that are not constitutional. I veto them. We're going to make sure that we actually appoint people that actually are going to do their job and, and care for the planet and care for the people. These are the things that I can do, right? But we're challenging people to like, look at guys, do not think one governor is going to save you. This is all hands on deck. We're in such a deep hole. We need everybody and everybody counts. So what we're doing is we're challenging people to say, look at, we want you to run. We don't care about your party affiliation any longer. You can be over here, libertarian, you can be a Dem, you can be a Republican, but we can still, you can, you can be in different parts of the sea and still head towards the same shore, right? There's many different routes to the same shore. That's what we're asking about. So we want people to run at that school board level, at the city, the state, the federal level with the seventh generation principle as the foundation of their of their whole candidacy. So you can be a libertarian and still think about seven generations from now. You can be a, a de Democrat and you can still think about seven generations. So that's what we're doing. And then we go even beyond that. We're like, okay, guys, this is more than a political campaign. This is, we're talking about a cultural shift here. We want a cultural shift in California. And we want this to catch on fire around the whole entire planet. And this is what we're asking people to do. Your legislators, your leaders have convinced you that they're in, they're in charge of your destiny. And that's absolutely not true. What, where your destiny goes is how you think and the actions that follow. You have 12 to 60,000 thoughts a day. They are connected to actions. Now, just imagine for a moment, if you take some of those actions and you make sure that when you, you make those actions, that they're based upon that seven generation principle. And so what happens is over time, you maybe, maybe 20% of the time you actually make decisions based upon the seven generation principle or maybe 50, maybe 70. Well, guess what? Over time, right? You know, as you're moving, you'll change you know, that you'll change the trajectory by a lot within seven generations, even within one or two generations, right? And so, and people will ask me like, well, what do you mean? What do you mean by that? I'm like, well, it doesn't matter if you're a doctor, a policeman, a, uh, you know, a fireman, a, a parent, a, a, you know, a garbage man. Let's say you're a farmer, for instance, and these are my two examples, is you have a crop and you've got some weeds here and you want to spray your weeds. Do you spray with Roundup or do you spray with white vinegar? Which better serves the seven generation? Let's say you have food you want to take. Do you put it in a one-time one use styrofoam container or do you put it in a multi-use stainless steel container? Which better serves the seventh generation? And the be beautiful thing about this is, because I think we're all tired of the micromanaging, right? We're like, get out of my business. The government does not belong in my business, does not belong in my life, does not belong in my education, does not belong in my family, does not belong in my living room, and certainly does not belong you know, beyond my skin. People are done. It's what's so beautiful about the seven generation principle is that you can be over here in these waters with this kind of current and this kind of wind, right? And you can be over here, but we can all still head and, you know, you're, you're tacking back and forth. It might be looking, you're going this way or that way, but you're actually heading towards the shore according to the wind that you're facing. So it's not about me micromanaging your life. You figure that out for yourself, but we have a standard. We have a cultural standard. Do we have a cultural standard in our world right now? Is there any cultural standard that we're all trying to, like, this is our goal as a humanity? As a I mean, not, not one that's being fulfilled or recognized. No. <laughs> and the Iroquois knew that. They knew that. They knew they had to have that in order to keep the constitution. Because I know if you have a ship, a boat, and it has no momentum, and it's bobbing up and down, and the propeller's not spinning, or the wind is not, you know, filling the, the, the sail, that thing will actually rattle and fall apart and sink to the bottom of the ocean. It's the seventh generation principle. That's, that's, that's what gives that vessel the momentum. So it can cut through the crap, right? It can get through the storm. It can get through the high waves. And we don't have that in society. And so on the front end, you have to have that seven generation principle. And, and I don't have to micromanage you because the thing is too, this is not about perfection, right? This is not a, about even a hundred percent. Sometimes you might just go, you know what? I can't make the decision right now on the seven generation principle. I'll do it all the other times, but this time I just, I have to do it this way. It's like, okay, but are you doing it some of the time? You're still going to change the trajectory of our lives. You're still going to benefit the seven generations if you do it more than not. That's on the front end. Now let's talk about the back end. And this is my favorite part. So when I was mayor in 20, 2012, um, I want to know how I'm doing. I want to know how my community is doing. And I, we didn't have a metrics for that, like a measurement, right? And when I was looking in America, like, well, what do we do to measure our wellness in America? Well, there is no measurement beyond the GDP, which is gross domestic product. And then when I start looking at that, I'm like, well, wait a second. The GDP, what? What adds to the GDP? Uh, death, illness, catastrophic fire, hurricanes, you know, um, you know, car accidents. I mean, nothing that actually measures our wellness. What it's measuring is somebody's making money off of bad things and it looks good because it's like, oh, our GDP is bloated, but it doesn't measure our wellness.
So I looked to the country of Bataan. Do you know about the happiness index? No. Well, this is fantastic. No. So for years, what they did is they, every to this day, every year, the citizens take like a 70-page uh, survey, which I never have Americans do because we don't have the, the patience for that. But in this, they take this survey to see how well their citizens are doing. And they ask questions like, how fat's your ox? How tall is your, your wheat? I mean, those kind of questions, right? Well, that wouldn't apply to Americans. But we have a, an American version of this. And there's certain areas in the community, mostly I'd say probably more liberal communities, but they have a way to take a sur survey. Every citizen can do it every single year. And it's non-identifying information. So it's not like the government's going to know your business. Um, and what they do is they ask questions like, um, do you have access to clean water? Do you feel safe in your neighborhood? Do you have access to higher education, to arts, right? Um, do you have access to hiking trails? Do you have time to have sit-down dinners with your family? These are the measurement of wellness. Do you feel like your government, your government local representatives are hearing you and representing you? Well, guess what? If you have your citizens take that survey every single year, you can dial that down to the neighbor, to the zip code. And you can go back to your elected official and say, hey, you know what? Your community does not feel safe. So you've got a year to clean that up. You've got a D on your report card. You've got a year. And if you don't do it, we'll recall you or you'll never get elected again. We need measurement. And right now there's no measurement. And so I did that in Nevada City in, in 2012. And let me tell you, it was not very popular with a lot of people because they're like, don't start measuring us. Really? No, no. It got, it got squashed really, really fast. And I couldn't understand why. And now I'm looking back at, oh, of course you didn't want us to measure you. So... You got the front end, you got the back end. The front end is the goal. The back end is we're going to measure you. And this is the beautiful thing. You ready? None of this is incumbent upon me winning. If I win, we'll kick butt. We'll do amazing things. But if I don't win, you can still do all of this. You can still, right? You can still pursue the seventh generation. You can fill that into your life and how you think, how you show up as a leader in your own community, in your own family, in your own life. And then also, if you want to, you don't need the legislators to pass the happiness index, the wellness index. You can implement it in your own town. It's online. You can sign up and get it going in your own community. Do some press releases about it, you know, promote it and do it every single year and measure your elected officials anyway. The objective is this, is we are, we're not playing in the, on the, the, the same game board that we've been playing for generations. We're, we're starting a whole new game board over here, a whole different set of rules, right? Whole different set of, you know, little, um, you know, icons on the board and, and we're not playing by the rules any longer. So the objective is not to just say, oh, I've got to win an election. The objective is to change the face of California through the campaign itself. That reminds me of a great quote that I've heard before and I found on your site by old Buck, Bucky oh, Fuller. No. My to change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. That's, that's what I that's hear and right. what that's you're right. describing. Because right. as we were talking about, we've all been duped into you know, thinking that there's two choices, mm -hmm. you know, politically mm -hmm. speaking, which of course is the sum total of our culture is based on, you know, who's kind of supposed to be in charge. Mm -hmm. So we're all like running around in circles. And meanwhile, there's this whole other mm -hmm. infinite way that we could interact as a society mm -hmm. and as, as a culture, multiculture. And um, we're kind of like just distracted with our heads down in this sandbox mm -hmm. that's so limiting. Mm -hmm. So let's say, let's say you have a groundswell of, you know, grassroots, uh, bottom to top mm -hmm. support for your mm -hmm. candidacy mm -hmm. uh, to be elected. How does the money part of it work? And how does the uh, social awareness work in an age of censorship where the people can, the fox is guarding the hen house with the same people that are paying to put people into positions of power right. also control the media. And right. so all of it's rigged how are you right. navigating through the rigging of the whole system because right, not the least of which being the actual votes right, right i mean right, I, I think right. most people really right. well first of all we're highly mail doubt mail-in ballots now only in california so we're telling everybody to tell everybody to you know when when those polling places open you put your you put your ballot in so you know that reduces some of the chance of the mailman coming along and then somehow the box of ballots just disappear right yeah end up on some side of the road. Um, that's important. But again, we may not be able to counter that. That's why I'm like, look at, we got to swamp the system. And that is everyone's got to run at every level. Because, you know, if you have one or two people popping up being leaders, it's a game of whack-a-mole. And I've been there in my local 
town where I'm t- making a stand like, bam, and I pop up over here. They're like, bam, <laughs> over here, bam. And it just happens over. I'm like, you guys, if there's a hundred or a thousand of us, I won't be the only one getting hit over the head. They can't hit that many people over the head. So it's a numbers game. We got, we, we, and we outnumber them. That's what we're seeing with the truckers. We outnumber them, right? So the objective is to jump into the ring at every single level and swamp the whole entire system. Now, even then, if that doesn't work, that's why I'm like, look at you guys. If you're not willing to run with the seven generation principle at every single level, and I know there's people out there who've been thinking, well, maybe I should. I'm going to ask you. I don't know your name. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you're running for, but I'm going to personally ask you to run. Run like your life depends upon it because it does. Then, even if we can't get people to run, it's like when you're making your decisions day in, day out, just think about that seven generation principle and try as many times as you can to make decisions based upon that. And you've already changed our future. You know, we don't talk in our culture about legacy. Do you know the rest of my Alaska story? You probably do. Do you know? No. <gasps> you don't know the rest of my Alaska story? <laughs> I'm hearing it here essentially for the first time today. I mean, I heard you tell an abbreviated version of it. Okay, but not the aftermath? Like what happened after? No. Oh, no. this is so fun. I mean, it must have been big because of the way that you're operating in the world now. Uh, okay, so let's go back to me being adopted. I know Diamond didn't make it. I know Diamond you know, I know that I part, know. sadly. Okay, you ready? So I do my trip across Alaska, and now I'm 30 years old. I still haven't found my family because I've been looking for the Andersons. And then finally, um, I get my files open, my adoption files, and I find out my name was not Marcella Anderson, as my adoptive mother told me before she died. My name is Marcella Funston, F-U-N-S-T-O-N. And I'm like, Funston? I was like, I never had a chance of a normal name, Renette Senum, Marcella Funston, like, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I'm like, Funston, what kind of name is that? Well, it ends up I was born in San Francisco. And what happened was I find my real name, and then I find that when I started looking for my natural mother when I was 11, she was sick with breast cancer, would die about a year later at the age of 35. So I'm looking for her for 20 years, not knowing she died around the time I started looking for her. And she, it happens that about four and a half years after I was born, she gave birth to my natural half-brother, different, different dad, same mom. And we are now talking to each other for the first time. He's in Tokyo, Japan, working as a journalist. I get like an $800 phone bill after this conversation before Skype. It's 94. Oh, no, actually this time, it's no, it's 96 now. and um. And so it ends up that I had this really wild great-grandfather named General Frederick Funston. And in San Francisco, there's a Fort Funston and a Funston Avenue. That's, that's named after him. And so as I'm talking to my brother, and I'm giving a synopsis of my life, I can't believe you don't know this story. He says, um, um, Burnett, now, when you crossed Alaska, that was after you found out a great-grandfather did that, right? And I, I was like, what? I'm like, no, 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 you got the story wrong. I crossed Alaska. Because no, I know. There's, that's what he did. There's a Smithsonian Magazine article, May 89 edition, that goes talks about his life, and it goes into that very trip. And I'm like, no, 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 you're so confused. So I'm living right by UCLA, just a, you know, like a half a mile away. And as soon as I get off the phone, I literally jump into my car, go into the library, and in a half hour, my whole entire world is ready to be tipped upside down for good. So I am in the library. I got the Smithsonian Magazine in my hand because the internet was not like full-fledged at that time yet. And, and I find out my great-grandfather had been hired by the USDA to go up to Alaska to collect botanical samples to find out like what was up there in this new frontier, right? And he actually was the, 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 the further north of any white man at the time he went up there. And his trip was a total of two years long, okay? He did not have the luxury of flying into the Yukon headwaters like I did. He had to actually have the Tinglet Indians take him up to the headwaters, so I'm reading this and I'm like, wow, that's crazy. He started his, his trip on, on April 10th, my birthday. That's crazy. Wow, what a coincidence. And then as I continue to read, I'm like, oh, look at, oh, wow. He skied down the frozen Yukon River. And along the way, he shot and killed a sled dog to eat because he was starving. And I'm thinking to myself, that's crazy because I, I skied down the Yukon River and he snowshoed. And, and I actually saved a sled dog from being shot and killed and, and used him as my companion. I'm like, that's really crazy. And then, oh, wait. With two buddies, he cut down three trees and built an 18-foot-long canoe. <laughs> no way. And I'm thinking to myself, wait, I cut down three trees and I built, I built an 18-foot-long canoe. And then I keep reading. And then he paddled down the rest of the Yukon River in his canoe. And when he got into the, the Delta, he flipped his boat, lost most, not all, but a lot of his botanical samples and photographs. I'm like, that's funny because when I built my canoe, I actually put a little stabilizer on the boat, which really saved me. 
And, and I didn't flip my boat. And he did his trip in 1894. I did my trip in 99, 1994. He was 27. He turned 28 along the way. And I'm 27. And I, was, and I turned 28 along the way. <laughs> Are you serious? What the hell? And I'm thinking to myself, that's mathematically impossible. I'm thinking that's mathematically impossible. And I kept thinking, I can't, and I'm reading the words in the, the Smithsonian Magazine. I'm like, I can't, and I kept doing my math, my calculator. I'm like, no, exactly 100 years before, at the exact same age, exactly a 1,500 mile trip, exact, all in a 18 foot long, and I kept thinking, no, no, because I didn't even know my name yet. I didn't know my, fa- I knew nothing. And I'm like, who is this guy? This Frederick Funston, who in the world is this guy and what do I need to know? So, Frederick Funston, he is the most famous military figure you've never heard of. Really? Yeah. Five foot four, barely 100 pounds at the time of his death. He was the highest ranked military official in the country when he died. He had a massive heart attack and set the whole entire nation into shock because he had under his command Patton, Pershing, Dwight D. Eisenhower, and MacArthur. And he was actually overseeing Pershing as he had him pursue Pancho Villa at the time. And he drops dead of a heart attack, sends the whole entire nation into shock because he was supposed to lead us into what was known at the time as the Great War, World War I. Whoa. And instead, he drops dead and they gave his plan to Pershing and Pershing headed us into the war a few months later. So let's talk about legacy. And that's what this whole entire campaign is about. This is where the real influence comes in, right? So Frederick Funston, his father was a congressman who was six foot four, a whole foot, taller right than him. And um, Frederick Funston, he did a few things that left a big mar on, on our lives today. One of the things he did is during the Spanish-American War, he actually went into the Philippines and was the first ever to actually, in America, to actually democratic, to, to, to um, kidnap a democratically elected president, President Aguinaldo of the Philippines. But it brought the Spanish-American War to an early end. But at, later on when they found out he did this and how he did it, they're like, oh no, it was pretty, pretty brilliant. But still, you just kidnapped a democratically elected president. And well, we've done that since then a lot. And of course, Mark Twain, who was a big hero, childhood hero of mine, he did my great grandfather wrote scathing articles about him, right? But this is most, this is the most important part of the story. My great grandfather was second in command of the Presidio in San Francisco. The first in command this one night went off to a train to go to the East Coast for his niece's wedding. And the very next morning, the 1906 earthquake hits San Francisco. And my great grandfather's head of the, the, of the Presidio right now. So what he does is he actually declares martial law. He orders every tent and blanket west of the Mississippi with no communication to the outside world. He gets it within 48 hours, sets up refugee camps everywhere, Oakland, Berkeley, all that area, gets them all set up. And what happened was the morning that he was shaken out of his bed, he actually ran up in his little skivvies to the top of Knob Hill. He looked around and saw the whole entire city burning down in an inferno, ran right back down to his home where his wife was. I don't know what kind of calm, uh, you know, demeanor she had, but she handed him his morning cup of coffee and he looks at her and he says, love, pack the belongings into the, into the trunks. The house will be burning down today. And the house burned down about five hours later. <laughs> oh my God. And then what he did, because his inferno was just devouring the whole entire city. He's actually known as the man who saved San Francisco. He took what dynamite he could. This is very controversial to this day. People are like, oh, he used the wrong dynamite. I'm like, I'm sure he used whatever dynamite he could get his hands on. He Long Van Ness Boulevard blew up all these beautiful homes and buildings and, you know, and businesses. And it actually did stop the fire, but it continued on the flanks. But he'd saved a huge section of San Francisco. Wow. Well, then out of that, you know, later on when the dust settled after this, you know, later those homeowners tried to sue him and the U.S. Army and they lost. And out of it came a little ruling known as eminent domain. Wow. For the larger good. Wow. Do you know how many times I've spent my life fighting eminent domain? <laughs> Do you know just over a year ago, I was sleeping in a cemetery in my downtown Nevada City historic cemetery and spending the days watching a tree sitter as we were trying to stop Pacific Gas and Electric from coming in and, and cutting down our heritage trees. And they were using that same eminent, eminent domain to bully their way into our town. I've been to Standing Rock where they're using eminent domain. I'm like, Fred. Fred. Wow. And all of a sudden, Luke, I intrinsically, on a DNA level, understand what legacy is. And when I became aware of the story, first and foremost, like, I've got to share the story. People have to know the story. But now I'm like, no, 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 no. There's more than that. You've got a responsibility to it. 
you've got to respond. This was not happenstance. This didn't just happen. I was hellbent, hellbent on having a, an extreme weather experience. And certain doors open and certain doors close to get me to Alaska exactly 100 years later, doing the exact same trip, building the exact same boat at the exact same age for me to find this little nugget. Oh my God. That's golden. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So when people <clears throat> ask... Might be the coolest story I've ever heard on this podcast. And there have been a few of them. It's, it's a crazy story. It's insane. So that's, so in 2004, when I started working, you know, on, on building a better community, it was with the understanding of like, well, I got a legacy here. And I realized that, yeah, that proverbial, oh, you know, you cast a stone into the pond and it ripples. Well, we're actually more the ripple than we are the stone. And I realized that I'm thinking, well, you know, Frederick Funston didn't know that, that eminent domain was going to become weaponized. He didn't know that, right? That was going to be almost used against us. But when I think of his spirit, he was, he what he, Carnegie and Roosevelt were the standard bearer for American imperialism. He was actually on the presidential ticket with Roosevelt as the vice president. And as he was traveling around the country doing the stump speeches, going, oh, American imperialism, it's great. Oh, we're going to do it. We're going to take over the whole entire planet. It's wonderful. Well, guess what? Roosevelt's campaign team kept saying to him, shut up, stop talking about the plan. Well, he wouldn't shut up. And like, if you don't shut up, we're going we're gonna to pull you off the ticket. He wouldn't shut up. And they, they pulled him off the ticket. But he was a standard bearer for this. And he actually believed in going out there. He believed in the white man's burden. He believed in going out there and, and you know, and, and democratizing the whole entire planet. So when I think about his spirit, that continues in his actions. That continues in those ripples across the pond. And here is his great-granddaughter having to deal with it. Not even knowing her name, not knowing her family, not knowing about his actions, he, has, he actually disappeared behind the shadows of the World War I heroes. As soon as World War I happened, he just kind of disappeared into the shadows. But still, without knowing who he, who he was or his name, we're dealing with his actions. And I'm like, oh my God, what are we leaving behind? What are we? And now more than ever with the children, these last two years, I'm like, oh my God, what are we leaving behind? Oh my God, the legacy, what have we done? So guess what? I'm hellbent once again, like crossing Alaska, I'm on a mission. And whether I make it into that gubernatorial seat, we're still going to talk about seven generations and we're going to change the culture in California and America and the rest of the world because I did not cross Alaska and lose my eyelashes for nothing. <laughs> right? We're going yeah. to do it. And I believe this is Fred way behind me saying, I'm so sorry. Let me, let me, let me dole up my, my great granddaughter and see if she can clean up this mess a little bit. And that's, that's the mission that I'm on. Wow. And that's what the seven generation principle is about. That is what this blueprint for California. And that's the message that I'm sending, right? That I'm sharing with everybody. But it's also not just sharing the story. It's like, no, no, no. It has to come with some action. And this is the action that I'm taking. I'm running for governor for California. Hot damn. Right? Wild. Out of all of the incredible healing tools and gadgets I have around the house, there aren't many that I use every day. One brand that consistently makes it into my routine is Higher Dose. I usually start my day on their large infrared PEMF mat, which combines the powerful technology of infrared heat with PEMF for an incredible recharging experience. PEMF, if you don't know, stands for Pulsed Electromagnetic Field, and it works by sending electromagnetic waves through your body at different frequencies to help your body's own recovery process. It's uh, relaxing while energizing at the same time, which is incredible. So I use the smaller mat here in the studio since it fits comfortably in an office chair or on the sofa and the regular size mat for meditating or napping. You can also do yoga on the big one if you were so inclined. And I'm also a long time infrared sauna user, but they can be both bulky and expensive. So if you don't have the budget or the room for a full size sauna, the higher dose sauna blanket is a game changer. It's portable and super easy to use and store when you're not using it. You just turn it on, put on some cotton clothing, wrap yourself up like a burrito and sweat like crazy. The sauna blankets got an amethyst layer to deepen the benefits of infrared, a tourmaline layer that generates negative ions, a charcoal layer to bind any pollutants that come out of your body, and a clay layer, which is balancing for the heat. So this is really cool stuff, and you can snatch yourself your very own infrared sauna blanket or PEMF mat at higherdose.com today. And if you use my exclusive promo code LUKE15 at checkout, you'll save 15% off. 
That's higherdose.com, D-O-S-E. And the promo code again is Luke15. In terms of, uh, you know, local wins Mm -hmm. for people that might hear this and go, oh, it's just too big. Like the beast is just too multifaceted. What were you able to achieve with the 5G stuff in Nevada City? Well, you know, it's, it's, is that an imminent domain sort of issue as well, well where they come in and they're like, well, well it's going to benefit the it is now. city if we have a bunch of 5G towers everywhere. It, it, well, well, I I did stop. We did when I got on uh, 2016, when I got reelected, um, Verizon came in and they were trying to put eight antennas on the top of our, one of our historic buildings. And and it was because of me. I sent them packing because I was able to prove they, they did not have a what's called gap in service. So I knew the political scene and I knew you know, I was fighting wireless enough and going down and testifying at the Sacramento Capitol enough to know, okay, this is where the the weak link is. And I pushed that and we were successful, but they have used and they are using eminent domain, which is, I mean, across America, they're using eminent domain everywhere, you know? And I'm like, oh my God, Fred, (laughs) you know, I got a a big, big job ahead of me, you know? Um, But, but see, this is the thing is that I think once people realize, and and there's been some really good, um, you know, federal cases that, that we now know for a fact that they are doing things illegally. And once people become aware of that, we can start kind of dismantling this. But I was listening to your wonderful Charles Eisenstein interview and, you know, it's, this is not about coming head on and fighting this beast. It's about, you know, the art of war, transmuting the energy. So this blueprint for California, as a matter of fact, we looked at the biggest challenges we're facing, right? And some of them are the, the reduction of the pollinators, right? The reduction of the loss of the topsoil, the loss of legacy farms. And we're all about regenerative farming and using, um, you know, community gardens and so on to actually rebuild the frayed fabric of community and, and start building our relationships back up again and start the healing. We're, our whole entire economic plan is based upon healing and restoration. Like as Buckminster Fuller says we can do, it's like we're going to, now is the time. So, so right now people are not aware of what's really going on with 5G. It's much more sinister and much larger than most of us realize. And it's having a huge impact on our bodies. I go down to Los Angeles and I get blurry vision, I get headaches and I'm just cooking down there and the pollinators are dropping. So once we realize what's going on, we're going to have to probably live a more simple life. And right now when I drive up I-5, there are huge, huge towers everywhere and they have nothing to do with our phones. They have nothing to do with with us, with service, right? Um, you know, and I've been warning people that look at even our own Congress a few years ago, after congressional hearings said to Huawei and ZTE, who are the ones making the, the the motherboards, right, and the hardware for our phones and for our antennas, they told AT&T and Verizon and Comcast, stop doing business with them because they have back doors to all this. These are towering Trojan horses and people don't get it. And so I'm kind of, I've been sounding the alarm for a long time. So so what's really important here is that we've got to stop participating in the system that's that's causing our demise. It's that easy. And we need to decentralize. We need to regionalize. And I've said to people, look, we have been turned into a generation of consumers. And now because of what's going on with China, Evergrande, the bond market, inflation, printing dollars because of, you know, C-19, all these different things, we, are, we have no choice but to go from being um, consumers to producers, regionally, locally getting to know your farmer, right? Knowing, having a blacksmith again, or, you know, people who repair our, our, you know, our, our appliances and stuff like that. We have no choice. Knowing who we are, knowing our neighbors, we're going to have to do that. And I'm, I'm going to say it's probably going to be a much more beautiful life because I think we yearn for that now. We, we want a deeper life as well. And so the objective is to do the Akita move where you just transmute the biggest challenges we're facing and decentralize and just say, you don't have my permission. I don't give you my consent and I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to ask for permission. I'm just not going to participate. I'm going to go over here and I'm going to participate in this decentralized, regionalized local economy. And because we have been so subjected to screens in the last two years, which by the way, have been weaponized, we have been traumatized. It's been, we've been undergoing psychological warfare. Don't kid yourself. It's called Biderman's Charter Coercion. Do you know Biderman's Charter mm-hmm. Coercion? You don't know? Oh, this okay. What have we been subjected to? Biderman's chart of coercion. So it ends up Amnesty International back in the 50s. They went out and they looked at the biggest despots and dictators around the planet to see what they would do to prisoners of war to create them, to, to make them break, right? Only eight steps. First and foremost, the most important one, isolation. isolation. Right? Humiliation, yeah. right? Um, you know, rules that you apply, then you don't apply, right? Omnipotence, I got my mask on, you don't. I'm social distancing, you aren't. 
and this 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 is kind of the break you down type of situation. That the, when you look at Biderman's, it's spelled B-I-D-E-R-M-A-N-S. Biderman's chart of coercion. When you look at those eight steps, you clearly see that we've been subjected to that. And you're like, how dare you, leaders? How dare you do this on such a massive global scale? And so that's what we've been subjected to. And it's been through the screens, right? That's where they got us. They sent us home. They closed our doors. We were all on the screen, no longer face-to-face where we can actually have a heart-to-heart connection, speak our truth without that information, that metadata being usurped and used against us. And we went, we were undergoing, and we still are undergoing psychological warfare. God, it's such, it's such perfection in the way that they orchestrated it too, because you've got the isolation and then you have not only the force feeding of propaganda and more fear and more limbic system damage to the populace, but then anything outside of that feed of information has been silenced. That's right. You know, step by step. So it's like cutting out all right. alternative points of view, force feeding. And that's what abusers do. Yeah. That's what abusers so do. It's a cult. Yeah. It's a freaking cult. It's, it's, it's abuse. It's abuse. Yeah. That's what it's yeah. like a spousal abuse, right? They, yeah. they ostracize you from your family and they just diminish you and demoralize you and isolate you and make you question yourself. And, and it's horrific. And, and I, and Lou is, and I have to say though, Luke, and I want your listeners to understand this is it's been really hard, obviously on all of us. I don't know anybody who's not impacted by this. But it had to happen. It's, it's, it's a spiritual transition that we're in. Right? This is a spiritual war. And if we did not go into the dark depths like this, we would never come out the other side. We have to, it's like a birth canal. We have, to, we have to go through this darkness. It's really intense. Lots of pressure. Like, where am I? Where am I? And then we're going to pop out one day and go, whoa, that was it. And I think that we have to, we're going to reckon on the other side that we're much more powerful than we believe we are. And that really the control is in our hands. And we've been over the generations through the public education right system, which again, it's two goals ever, right? Have been to, to make sure there's never any dissent in the individual and that we remove all originality. Those are the two goals in the public education system. Well, good job. They've done it. They have done it right here. We are generations later. And sure enough, you know, um, we're not thinking for ourselves. We're not trusting our instincts. You know, we can't critically think like we used to. And that's where they wanted us so that they could do this to us. Who's they? I don't know. People are like, who are they? I'm like, I don't know. I'm going to assume the establishment, (laughs) the 1% of the 1%, the people who are in control. I don't know. That's another two hour conversation. Yeah. But that's where we are. It doesn't really matter either in a sense, right? Matter. Because you can't stop them. You can just go build something new well, to and replace that's, it. And that's Buckminster's whole thing. It's like, yeah. it's not about fighting them. And there probably will be, you'll probably see in the next few months, little fights cropping up here and there. But really, it's about transmuting our own leadership and how we show up in the world and just starting the new reality. And when you start the new reality, you think about that seven generation principle. Again, I didn't have to go out there and figure it out. Fred was the one to tell me, Renette, look in the rear view mirror. Renette, look behind. If you look behind you, you'll see a pattern. You'll see reoccurring beats in the story, and then you'll recognize them in current time. So when I'm looking back at Fred, I started looking back in the Constitution, looking at that going, wait, there's more there. What am I not seeing? I'm like, oh, oh, the seven generation principle. We forgot to apply that to the nation. Thank you, Fred. Right? Thank you for, for making me wake up to what's behind us. So now I can see what's ahead of us. And, and there we are. And so this campaign, Luke, me running for governor, our awakening could never have happened without COVID. The people were not ready for a decline to state candidate. They were not ready for uh, the seventh generation principle. They were not ready to fight for their children's future until now. And here we are. And the floodgates are opening. I mean, I'm, I'm out in the streets. I'm campaigning. I'm talking to people across the whole political spectrum. And they're done. And that is the sense I've been getting really for the last few weeks. They're done. They're done. They want something different. And we're primed. We're ready to go. Let's start. Let's I think go. that's the that's the key to a shift is getting out of the polarization, right? And there's like you and I were discussing earlier that that middle group, right? That's not a, a hard no, like someone like me is against all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And then you have the just, I'm just going to listen to my TV people and anything that the TV tells me to do, I'm going to do that and nothing else, right? I trust mm-hmm. my government and blindly like just fear, you know, people that are in a lot of fear that are willing. But then this middle group is, I think a, a, a group that's growing and growing. Every day. 
And they're starting to realize, wait a minute, I did the things. I closed Mm -hmm. my business. I I put something in my body and maybe things went wrong. And I I masked my kid. You told me to. And now we find out it wasn't necessary and that now they, you know, are developmentally challenged. I mean, you know, overdoses, domestic abuse. Suicide. Yeah, just the the massive, massive repercussions of this, I think are starting to, because it's been a couple of years, hit that middle group. Yeah. And I think many of them, from what I perceive, are starting to lean more in the side of the questioning, yeah. you know, more discerning, hard-headed, maybe at yeah. times, uh, group that I would consider myself in, you know, you know just I, don't trust anything the government says ever, you know, I, well, and, <laughs> until and, it's proven otherwise, which is you know, infrequently. It, it, just trust yourself. You know, trust, we, we give so little credence to our own intuition, right? Right. And now all of a sudden we're like, wait a second, you know, we, we really need that common sense. And we talk about common sense education, like, you know, you know, teaching children to critically think, teaching them how to use their hands, you know, bringing back the, the, the trades, right? And um, getting them back out into nature and, and being attuned to the seasons and, you know, mother nature and the animals and themselves, right? And and sensing their way through the life. You know, we've, we've really set, set that aside over the generations and now we realize how important it is. And so, we're, we're going to, we're going, we are returning to that, but it had to be the depth of the old system. And so there are such cracks and fissures in the old system that people like me, a little old mayor, 3,100 people is like, ah, there's a crack. I can get my foot in that door. Here we go. And we're wedging it open. And, you know, and so the thing is, you have to understand the system that we have, we are, we've been encapsulated in for generations. It, it is, it, it has been planted with a seed of, of destruction. It, it, it will destroy itself at some point. It just, that's this kind of a system. So we don't have to really fight it and kill it. It's going to kill itself. We just have to go off and just start building our world that we want. And I don't even have to say, go do it. It's already being done. I've had people in the past say, Burnett, how are you going to convince people to go sustainable? I'm like, I'm not. You can't. But we have to be ready when they have no other option. So when people realize that they've got to actually start doing something differently, we can help them. Like, here, how about this? What about that? There's so many different things that we can do. And that's what gets me excited. I've been doing it on the micro level. Now all I have to do is just scale it up. It's all doable. Yeah. We've already been doing it. Yeah. I think um, my perspective of that or experience of that has been in being into alternative health for a couple decades and Mm -hmm. seeing things now becoming commonplace that used to be like ozone therapy or something right? which used to be super so out there super fringe right, you know right, even infrared right. saunas when i first got into that is like didn't know many people that knew what that was or that had one mm-hmm. and now having the show for a few years it's really exciting and shocking to me really young people are aware of all this stuff and they're doing it you know it's <clears> i think <throat> as things are getting more um sort of um constricted from outside of us these forces the powers that be I, I think that we and they don't realize that with the advent of the internet, despite um, you know censorship and all the things we're seeing now, that our ability to share information and the ability for people to educate themselves so quickly right. from podcasts like this and YouTube videos and things. I mean, you can bypass the education system, spend time devouring content, educate and empower yourself, and you're living in a totally different world. And you're and you're also becoming an expert. Yeah, yeah. In, in that respective yeah, field, yeah. Because right? I used to feel like kind of an expert, and now I get messages from people all the time, and they're schooling me on stuff, and I'm like, wait, what? you're 22. <laughs> like, how did you win? You well, know? and I I do believe right now that we had a lot of college students who really believed in the Biden administration, and now they're having this total reckoning. Like, what? He's giving us crack pipes instead. That's what he's. That's what he's doing for us. It's like. This is the system. This is exactly what we're talking about. And in particular, I want to talk to the people in their 20s. Even if you think the system is flawed, go out and you have got to register and you've got to vote and you've got to show up because this is your future. You and I are not, I'm older than you, but we're on the other side of our life, right? We've lived a lot of our life. They're just starting their life. So they have a lot more to lose than us. And they're going to be the tidal wave when they wake up and they are waking up right now and they realize what's going on and they realize the two-party system is an absolute fraud. It's just a mirage, right? They're going to be a force to be reckoned with. And we're watching the rumbling right now under the... under. The- I see that on TikTok. Oh. The stuff, the stuff young people on TikTok are posting because uh, my wife sends, you know, I don't know, she must be getting the algorithmic feed mm-hmm. of some of the counter culture right. news and whatnot, um, even though she's not really into any of this stuff, I'm um, like I am, but she sends them to me and it's like 
some kid talking about the Rothschild banking system or I'm like, what? what? I know. Geoengineering, you know, I'm like, <laughs> how do you guys know about this stuff? But it's like, I'm 51. Right. So you know, it was, I, it was harder for me to uncover some of this stuff. It was uh, right around the time the internet. Um, it wasn't out was, there. Yeah. It I mean, there was, yeah. you know, very fringe yeah. weird yeah. websites yeah. that you could, yeah. you know, get some alternative news from, but now it's, it's just crazy. It, it gives me hope, you know, and those, that's what I have to hang on to myself because if I get too into like the the fear porn and the just the documentation from around the world of of what's going on and some of the mm-hmm. grievous harms upon humanity, it's pretty. It's, it's it's dark. It's atrocious. It's dark. And I don't want and the people who've been harmed and the people who die who've died. I don't want them to die or be harmed in vain. It's like no, not on my yeah. watch. It's just not going to happen, right? So so it's that too. It's like I I see. I mean, we've lost friends and family members in these last couple of years for what's happened. It's real for us too. It's very real. I'm like, no, I'm not going to let them pass in vain or be injured in vain or terrible things happen to them in vain. It's like, no. So it just, it just kind of fuels that fire even more. Right. It's like, we're going to, we're going to, you know, we're going to change this and shift this. And that's where we are right now. So, you know, I came across a quote last week. I'm like, Oh, I love this quote. Something like man has never invented a material as strong as the human spirit. Right. And it's true. The human spirit is remarkable. I mean, even like, me crossing Alaska, if somebody had said to me, hey, Renette, in order for you to get from this point to that point, your eyelashes are going to have to freeze off. You're going to have to ski this many miles a day. You're going to have to find a dog, learn how to build a canoe, da 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 Oh, be chased by a wolf pack. Oh, the bear <laughs> encounter. And I'd be like, are you crazy? I can't do that. But then when the moment would come and I was faced with it, right? Either like I give up or I find a different way to continue. I always found a different way to continue. That is the human spirit that's in every single one of us. So everyone is born right now in this moment of time because they're meant to be born. They're meant to rise to a whole new occasion. This is spiritual warfare. And and I tell people we've already won. We've already won. I'm on the other side already looking back. If you want to know what it looks like, I can tell you it's really beautiful. We've already won. The question is, how long is it going to take? That's where our leadership and our activity and our action comes in. Is it going to be six months or is it going to be 60 years? That's, that's up to us, right? We've won, but how long? That's where we come in. What can people do to support your campaign? Well, censorship, word of mouth, right? I know on a micro level that when people promote, let's say, an event, you see it advertised here and there, but you don't hear about it, eh? The turnout might not be so good. But when you start hearing a buzz on the street and chatter and people are talking about it, that's when you know it's going to be a big event. So we're asking people, when you hear this story, you send it out to everyone you know. You tell them to send it out to everyone they know. You start talking to everybody, your neighbors, the grocery store line, you know, in the library, at the gas station. Do you know Renette Sunham? She's running for California governor. Governor, no party affiliation. It's for the children. Let's go, Right. That's what we need to do. We need to circumvent and sidestep the censorship, right? And it's, I was in South Africa in 87 at the height of apartheid, 19 years old, hitchhiking across the townships in South Africa. It was really wild. And censorship was huge, but the word of mouth was so powerful. And we got to go back to that word of mouth. The other big thing is getting people to run. Please run at every level. If you don't want to run, please start reading up on the seventh generation principle. See what that is. Fold it into your life. And the other big thing is we don't have the donors. We need money. We, you know, we're, we're scrappy. We're in the ring with the big boys, but we don't got the multi, multi millionaire, you know, guys putting the money in the corporations and the dark money. It's us. It's you. It's me. It's everybody. So we need the donations as well, but we're not going away. We're not going away. Even after the election, we're not going away. This is forever. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for joining me today. Oh, Luke. So, so exciting. Yeah. So exciting. Yeah. As I said, you know, it's some somewhat out of the lane of my normal show. But when I saw you speak at that event, I was like, man, she's on fire. <laughs> I don't know. I don't care what we talk about. I just like love your your yeah. passion and your thank heart. You. So thank you for sharing it oh, with us. Oh, really? I yeah, really appreciate super cool. you. And I, and I think right now where we are in the world too, from feedback I get from listeners, I mean, we need we also need to hear this. Like we need solutions, man. It's right. Everyone, whether whether you believe in the official story of what's happened over the past couple of years or not, or you do, it's like we're all, like you said, we're all trying to meet in the middle and find a solution because this is definitely not it, the direction we're going. 
is and is we, finite. And we are you know, the solution. We're the solutionarians. We are yeah. the solution. It just it just requires our engagement. Yeah. Which we have not been engaging for generations. We just have to engage with the with the purpose, with the measurement. That's that seven generation principle. Yeah. So we're gonna we are going to do it. I can already see it. Well, I'm fired up. My last question for you is who are three teachers or teachings that have influenced your work in your life? Oh, my goodness. You know, I'm going to answer this and later on go, oh, I should have included da-da-da. That's common. Uh-huh. Well, Buckminster Fuller, right? He's really huge. Um, gigantic. Uh, I'm trying to think of who else. Oh, my God, I have so many, actually. You know, I, I have some big, big people, but I have to say that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually make it more personal. Buckminster Fuller, so ahead of the curve. Um, but I'm going to actually say my... my uh, Actually, I'm going to have to say Frederick Funston. He taught me what to do and what not to do, mm -hmm. right? And the other person I have to say is my partner, Susan. Yeah. She's so beautiful and she's so kind and so generous and so um, just such common sense. She's my rock. So I have to say Susan. Someone like you has got to have a pretty sturdy rock. Yeah, she's amazing. Yeah. I could see it in your, I could see the emotion. Yeah. There's nothing better than being in love, man. I'm yeah. telling you, when yeah. you meet the person, yeah. it's just. Couldn't do without her. Yeah. I mean, you can't, yeah. you can't, like, I can't imagine what life was like before. It's like, what was I doing that whole time? I know. And what would I do? God forbid, you know? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's. Yeah. Well, well, I can tell. She's yeah. She's beautiful. Yeah, she is. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a great shout out. Thank you for that. Uh, well, man, I think we did it. So again, guys, you can find all of the show notes um, at, you know, uh, lukestory.com slash wake the bear. But what about websites? Like if somebody wanted oh, to donate or get you. on board, like we'll put it all in the show notes sure. in one place. But in case someone right now is like, okay, I'm you into this. Okay. How so can I help? I'll give you several different things. One is elect Renette. So it's E-L-E-C-T, elect Renette, R-E-I-N-E-T-T-E, -E -E, com. Go on there. And you actually, if you look under my service, you'll see like almost 20 years of the community work I've done. So you kind of know who I am. Um, we have a big event happening on uh, March 6th in my area, my hometown near Nevada City, a big crab feed if you want to come on in. Um, and again, you can make donations there. We really do need the donations. We're fighting the big boys here, as you can imagine. Um, and then if you want to learn even more about me and the actually, the uh, <clears throat> Alaska trip, if you go to my personal blog, the, T-H-E, Foghorn Express, the foghornexpress.com, you'll find out more about me. And, and then you can kind of look under about where it says Alaska trip. You'll see some historic photos of my great-grandfather. You'll see his canoe. Oh, cool. You'll see some video footage. I'm I so shot. glad I didn't see that site because <laughs> I thought all this was relatively new to me. So I'm like, oh, that's it's cool. Great. I would have ruined it for myself. Yeah, no, no, no. It's a great, I'm glad you didn't know. Spoiler, I would have spoiled, done a spoiler on myself. No, no, no. So there's that. So that's okay. The foghornexpress.com. And then if you go to BitChute, you look up Renette Senems. Don't forget my name because it, you won't find it easily. Renette Senems, chew on this. You'll see, and I'm not really doing any more more interviews because it's covered. People are doing interviews, yeah. right? That's great. Yeah. The void has been filled. But you'll see over the last year and a half, starting in the summer of 2020, where I just started just, you know, interviewing and interviewing and just trying to bring the information to people. And that's how I roll. So that's if you want to know who I am, if you check out those sites, you'll have a good idea who, cool. who I am. Yeah, one of your bit shoot videos was where you were interviewing these um injury victims. Oh. I was just I was watching that this morning. I was like, I can't watch anymore. This is too sad, man. So brutal. And, so and I've got so many more stories. I haven't, I just don't have time. Yeah, you know, other people yeah. are capturing that, but, and I did ask them, by the way, I'm like, when you did research, did you know that this could do this, this, these injuries could be caused? And they're like, no. And I asked them, I said, did you ever search on a different engine other than Google? And they all said, no. I'm like, okay. Yeah. 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 Of course not. You won't find it on Google. Yeah. I don't even try. <laughs> I know. Like Most I, people don't know that. If, if I'm looking for something important, at least, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. So we'll put all that stuff in the show notes. And anyone listening to this on a podcast app will be all of the oh, links that you just thank mentioned. You. And thank and all you for that. who yeah. you are and how you show up. You're just a beautiful soul. And I'm really appreciative of you. Big thank time. you. Well, yeah. I appreciate that. Thanks for making yeah. the time to come out here and also doing some travel. You know, it's like... You know, from doing your Zoom interviews, it's yeah, yeah it's just it's so much better to sit down and hang out with someone. Oh, is a, no. It's a different experience, totally different. It's like it so, gets in your DNA. Yeah, so yeah, I appreciate it. Does, and you know. if I get back to California, you oh, know, mi casa su casa, you I'd got love a place to, to, love stay. to come because I love that area up there. It's so beautiful, oh, the Yuba River. Oh, yeah, I shouldn't have said that. I should never. I should, don't want to <laughs> talk about it. Never mind. Cancel that. Erase that. Yeah, no, but no, no we'll, one yeah. go to the Yuba River. We do <laughs> not need tourists. Yeah, I think I heard it's polluted. It's terrible. Yeah, it's awful. 
dead yeah. fish everywhere. Yeah. yeah no. <laughs> Sorry. But yeah, I, I do love it up there. And I think just in, in preparing for this interview, I'm like, God, I really, you know, it's so many things about California I miss. It's just I know. such a beautiful, fantastic state with so many great people. It's ridiculous. It you know, should not the be... people there are cool. It's like you yeah. have some voting centers in, in San Francisco and LA that are making some pretty shitty decisions, but... I think every they're person, done. everyone I know in California is awesome. You know, I'm like, how have you guys voted so I know. poorly? Well, we're waking up yeah. really fast. Yeah, we are. I'm out there on the street. We're waking up. Nice. Keep up the good work. I will. Thank you, Luke. Well, if that didn't get you riled up and ready for action, I don't know what will, folks. What a powerhouse of a woman, man. Uh, sharing ideas with people like Renette has restored my faith in humanity and also my hope for a better future. Again, to support her campaign, visit electrenette.com, R-E-I-N-E-T-T, electrenette.com. Again, as a reminder, you can find all links, show notes, and complete transcripts at lukestory.com slash wake the bear. And let's definitely not forget to thank our sponsors, activationproducts.com, justthrivehealth.com, and higherdose.com. And for those of you who like some of the fringe content, uh, like what you just heard, don't forget to join my Telegram channel for the uncensored content related to, um, let's just say, current events. And I want to warn you, it's a bit of a shocking fear porn zone over there. Um, I keep all the love and light and inspiration here on the podcast and on my Instagram at Luke story. But I find so many things um, in my alternative news feeds that I think are just so important to share. So uh, without just nuking my entire brand by posting them on the more totalitarian social media platforms, I uh, started my telegram channel and you can join me there. If you're so brave at lukestory.com slash telegram. I'll also be speaking at Paleo Effects here in Austin, Texas, April 29th through May 1st. For those of you who missed the real human connection of live events, and I got to tell you, man, I am pumped to get back out there to see you beautiful people face to naked face. You can get your tickets to Paleo Effects and all of my upcoming events as they develop at lukestory.com slash events. All right, we'll be back next week with another episode of the Lifestylist Podcast. Until then, be well, keep the faith, and remember to share this episode far and wide. <laughs>